my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 677. And joining me is my co-host, Nathan. Nathan, how are you? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful Monday night here in the Bay Area. Can't complain. I had a weird day. I, uh, I got I to gotta tell you, I, I, we haven't, we've been talking actually for like, I want to say like 45 minutes probably, <laughs> like just yeah, off the air, yeah. right? catching yeah. up, whatever. I didn't tell you the story though. Today I was at a customer's house. I stepped in, in, in dog crap and it was like, it's it, it, one of those moments you don't notice to get to your car and you're like, what, uh, what is that? Yeah, yeah. Oh no. And you realize there's like a mess on the bottom of your car. And you get out. I actually put a shoe cover over my shoe to like just cap, kind of cap the mess and just deal with it. Yeah. But I get back to my apartment and I literally spent an hour and a half scrubbing the bottom of my shoe. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get that smell out of it. I just couldn't. Yeah. I've like gotten like my cleaning toothbrush. I'm like just rubbing it, like really trying mm. to. Tell and me more details about this. It was it was terrible. And I and then for the, like the next hour, like I'm cleaning myself. And no matter what I do, I feel like, I just feel like I smell it. I feel like I can't get it off me. Like it's all psychological at that point. But it's right. just. Two and a half hours of literally like cleaning myself, trying to get the dog crap feel and smell out of everything. And I washed all my clothes and it was just one of those days like you, I just couldn't get away from it. I, I'm not that I'm not really like a, a clean freak, but I just had a hard time with that. I just really <clears throat> it was yeah, bad. I would I would have thought you were in Dallas. All that dog shit. Oh, well, you got cats, dude. I'll take cat <laughs> crap all day. Something about dog poo specifically. The smell just. It's so awful and unsettling. It's like the worst thing in the whole world to me. I just hate it so much. Yeah, you say that, but I <laughs> guess, you know, guy, dude. you know, typically, you know, from a dog, it's out there in the wild. There's more opportunity for you to step on it. So I guess that's fair. Uh, let's start by talking about Monday Night Football. The Steelers beat the Giants 26 to 18 tonight on Monday Night Football. Um, I've got I want to say one thought just right at the bat, then I'll throw it to you. But first, I got to say it's very, very clear. Is the Steelers offense perfect? No. Are they are they six and two? Yes. And absolutely adding Russell Wilson as starting quarterback. We're two games in now. He was 20 for 28 tonight, 278 yards, had a touchdown pass. Not a perfect night from him, but he makes the offense better. He's making throws downfield and making yes. plays that I love Justin Fields. Justin simply didn't make. And then you watch them on the sideline, Justin and Russ like getting along together and smiling and having a good time. And you're like, man, I think Justin has got the maturity to take this opportunity to learn whatever he can from Russ. And I just think this, the way it's all played out at quarterback for the Steelers with, you know, a couple of games with Justin Fields, letting Russ, I think he really was injured, letting him get healthy, going back to Russ when they needed to. And uh, frankly, getting an extra gear out of the offense. And there's still a possibility to let Justin sit for some time behind Russ and he develops mm-hmm. and becomes the next guy. And you can pass the torch someday. I just think the quarterback position could not be in a better spot actually in Pittsburgh. And I'm shocked to say that because I, I did not really have a lot of confidence Russ was going to work out or be a, a good for them. And he's been two games in. It's still early, but exactly what they need. What say you? I'd say that the quarterback spot could be in a better position. But for what sure. we expected mm-hmm. from the Pittsburgh mm-hmm. Steelers, I think we're pretty spot on. I went into I went into this game expecting the Steelers to force like 800 turnovers against Daniel Jones, right? But for a larger part in that game, while the offense wasn't doing amazing for the Giants, they were taking care of the football. And I felt like that was important. They had a few miscues here and there. um, But at the end of the day, when push came to shove at the end of the game, that Steelers defense stepped up. They started getting to Daniel Jones, uh, sacking him, and ultimately having the fumble and the interception there on back-to-back drives to close it out. Uh, Once again, thoroughly impressed with the Steelers defense. Uh, They did a great job, again, of creating pressure on Daniel Jones um, and limiting the effectiveness of Tyrone Tracy. Like, even though he ran for 100 and some odd yards uh, outside of outside of the one run, like he had to earn it. And that's not something you typically see from a Steelers defense where you have a linebacker and a safety get lost in the wash. Right. And the wash, meaning the whole line is trending one way. The running back starts to lean that way. And then, boom, he hit the cutback. So great run by Tracy, but not a mistake that you typically see from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, outside of that, yeah, just not enough offense really from either team. Um, but then that big spark came in the third quarter uh, with the punt return touchdown from Calvin Austin. He is so electric when the with the ball mm-hmm. in his hands. I really hope that on the offensive side of the football, they find a way to get the ball on his in his hands on a more consistent basis. Um, they're doing that with George Pickens now, but I hope that they start to get him more involved in a 
you know, over the top slash quick screen, quick screen type fashion. That's not necessarily in Arthur Smith's playbook, but would love to see that. Um, again, big tip of the cap to the Steelers defense and to Russell for almost playing a very, very clean game. He, he did give it up and it kind of kept the giants alive there for a minute. Yeah. Uh, but again, great. Uh, it was not a great game to watch, but a good game to watch despite how, uh, to be frank, how low quality I felt like the teams were today. I, I got to be very honest with you. Tonight, I had maybe my dream viewing scenario watching in the multicast of the World Series Game 3 and the Giants-Steelers um, game. I don't know that either game was great. I thought the, the baseball game was, was good. It was a shutout, so not a lot, not a lot of action happening. But then he got the, a, a fairly compelling, although not great, game on the left as well. And I just really... I've never had more fun watching two games at the same time. It really just, it, I don't know if I like that game as much by itself, e- either one of them, but together I thought it worked really well. I, I really have never watched baseball and football simultaneously before. And I'm like, wow, I, I actually would love to do this more often. I really, I'm kind of sad <laughs> baseball is ending. Cause I'm like this, this is awesome, dude. I should have done this like for years and years, but I just didn't know what I was I'm missing out on. Um, the two quickly, the two sports kind of lend themselves to playing with each other in between the play clock right at the end of a play uh-huh. and then you've got the the pitch clock some things kind of level out so you don't miss the action you know what i'm yeah. saying like thing things flow very well between those two i didn't watch it that way i i like to kind of zone in on one i did kind of flip back and forth um to the baseball game kind of at some dead moments overall um yeah not bad what i'll say about baseball I was trying really hard for like Instagram. I wanted a picture of both, you know, that wide shot in baseball with the pitchers on the mound and you kind of, you're behind him. That that's a standard classic baseball shot. I wanted that shot. And then I wanted the classic football shot, you know, the wide angle shot uh, from the sideline. I had a hard time getting those two things to show up on the screen at the same time. Cause it was just ping ponging back and forth. Uh, like, yeah. I, and it was good though, because I, from a viewer standpoint, you watch football till football's boring. Then they go to commercial. Then you look at baseball and you're just ping ponging back and forth. And it actually worked really, really well. But as far as trying to get like a picture for Instagram, I never could get them to show up at the same time, which is actually ideal, just really frustrating. We're trying to get that stupid picture. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of that ping ponging kind of back and forth, we saw with this Steelers and Giants game, we saw some ping ponging back and forth with these field goals. Both mm-hmm. teams not great in the red zone, yeah. particularly with the Steelers, who I think have more talent, a more experienced quarterback, <sighs> uh, and more <clears throat> weapons. What do you think is the limiting factor for them right now in the red zone. Cause it wasn't until late in the game when the giants had given up that they had really found a way to score. It's, I mean, so far it's in the first half is penalties. They literally had a touchdown caught off the board. They had another play. They got to the goal line. They had a, a big penalty. It pushed them way back. It's lots of little things. They're really close. I think to like this offense is clearly capable of more. Um, and it's just them getting in their own way because certainly the Giants' defense didn't stop them, in my opinion. Like they ran for a ton of yards, especially in the first half. They were just running so easily, and then they didn't finish drives. It wasn't the defense doing anything to them. It was them getting in their own way. A face mask calls back, a touchdown, a big penalty moves it way back to like second and twenty four, second and goal from the twenty four. Like they just got in their own way. Um, but those are also things you can clean up and fix. I mean, thankfully this happening it's the Giants. They've got a lot of tougher games ahead. I will say the Steelers at six and two. I, I think it's been a really fun year. I'm, I'm bracing for impact. I mean, you got the final 10 games. Here. We've talked about it for a long time. What's next is a gauntlet of their division of a lot of really tough games to the Steelers ahead. All you can do is really hope that, hey, the lessons they've learned in the first eight games can lead to a better team that finishes drives and cleans things up in the final 10 games. I'm not sure that's going to happen, um, but you've put enough on tape now with Russell Wilson even just to go like, hey, we're really close. Like there or like Van Jefferson had a touchdown. There was a great play where Russ, we've seen Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup for years at the Rams, you know, find a window against a zone defense. Van Jefferson has a window open against his own defense, but he doesn't recognize zone, mm. doesn't slow down in the window. Russ throws it where yep. it should be, and Van runs right through the window and runs himself, you know, covered basically. That should have been a touchdown. So there's lots of little things on film you can clean up with Pittsburgh, but they're all fixable. And they're all the Steelers beating themselves rather than the defense doing something that they just can't figure out. Yeah, that is one thing I do want to talk about for receivers in the red zone. One of the day one things, or perhaps it's not day one. It might be a touch more advanced than day one. But show your numbers to the quarterback. 
especially in the red zone. He has to feel like he can see your chest in that tight and congested area. Van Jefferson, like you said, kept going, never really gave his chest. Had he had given his chest, he maybe could have had a chance to slow down and get back to it or realize that Russ was about to release that football and he could have sat and stayed. So that's why it's so, so important um, that you turn and you get your chest around, especially in the red zone. Well, it begs the question, does he have a feel for the game? Does he understand zone defenses? Does he understand? You you would think he does, but not every receiver does. Like, again, Puka Nakua, I, I watched him play on Thursday Night Football, and I was like, dang, this guy really has just an understanding for what defense is trying to do to him, where to find green grass, how to get open, when to slow down in windows. And for Van Jefferson to not do that at this point in his career is like, man, does he not have what it takes upstairs to understand that part of the game like does he not is he not seeing things the way he should be at this point in his career it was actually i thought uh more concerning than than it i, I think maybe we, we talked about it as which is does van jefferson you know understand at this point in his career how to find green grass because i don't know that he's recognizing zone coverage at least it didn't look like he was on that play and to be in the nfl at this point and not do that is kind of wild yeah typically receivers that turn out to be journeymen, there is some sort of limitation to their game. And it's typically not the athletic side, right? If you're yeah. an NFL wide receiver, you've got a serious skill set offensively. Um, but yeah, do you well, have it cerebrally? Is To, a, to his credit, I, I think he's made a lot of plays in his career against man coverage, beating people over he the has. top. I, I, I think back to his time with the Rams, like, man, Van Jefferson beats a man deep. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. Like, there have been flashes of brilliance. But yeah, he had the um, the big ball earlier tonight. Yeah, like a 30 some odd yard catch. But maybe that's a flaw in his game is the understanding of zone coverages and what defense are trying to do to him and where to find green grass. Mm. And that's a next level understanding of playing a receiver position that I worry he doesn't have. Um, and all you can you know, his dad played the NFL. He's he's a pro. He's been a veteran now for I guess I don't know if veterans are a word, but he's been in the league for a while now. It's weird that he's at the point where that's still not figured out. Yep. Um. This Giants offense, even without that big run you talked about, uh, Tyrone Tracy would have had, without that run, 19 carries, 100 yards. So the big run was for 45 yards. They had 145 yards rushing. It's a fifth-round pick out of Purdue. He's got two two um, games this year with over 100 yards rushing. I don't know what to make of him. There was a great running back, I forget his name now, undrafted, uh, James Robinson, uh, with the Jaguars a couple of years ago. Kind of came out of nowhere, had a couple of good games. We've totally forgotten about him as a league. I don't know what Tyrone Tracy's future is, but he's certainly what I saw tonight was a running back making the most of not a great offensive line. And frankly, a really good defensive line in Pittsburgh. I, I really like this kid. I don't know what his future is. I don't know if he's going to be forgotten about in a couple of years, but certainly they found value in the fifth round with Tyrone Tracy in New York. Um, what do you make of him? I think they said it a number, a number of times on broadcast that he is a former wide receiver collegiately. Uh, yeah. What that means is he's going to have the skill set to move his feet quickly in a phone booth. That's one of the great things of a wide receiver is your ability to change direction on a dime. And yeah. that's what I feel like he does very, very well. And he has learned, and I think that this is part of being a wide receiver, from seeing linebackers and safeties play. He has an understanding of how to set the defense up as a running back. I'm not even sure that he knows exactly that he's doing it, but the way he presses one side before making his cutback, uh, the, patience, the patience that he shows before getting to the line of scrimmage, I think is very, very impressive, not just for a rookie, but for somebody who's just coming into that running back position. It's clear that he has a baller's mindset, if you will, in football, like just a guy get the ball in his hands. And he just has this great spatial awareness and understanding for the game and what's happening at not just the defensive line, but the level behind it. And I think that's special. Um, add to that, you know, Darius Slayton, um, he had a big ball tonight. He had over a hundred yards, like you had a hundred yard receiver and you had a hundred yard rusher. And it wasn't until late in the game that when you felt like you had to force things, that things really started to fall off the rails. But yeah, again, back to Tyrone Tracy, I think that he does have a future in this league. Um, I'm not sure what his top end speed, like top, top end speed looks like. Um, but I would feel very good if I'm the Giants continuing to lean on him. You've seen him essentially take the role cold cut from Devin Singletary, a, a guy who's started in the league for Buffalo for a couple years. Um, and then I believe he was with the Colts. He may be been with the Colts, but regardless, Tyrone Tracy, great talent. Um, again, a guy who can also catch passes out of the backfield, given his history, he could develop into, into a serious weapon if you have a competent O-line and quarterback. 
something that's got to be frustrating if you're a Giants fan. Um, twice you got the ball down eight in the fourth quarter with a chance to tie the game. And a consistent theme of Daniel Jones' career has been a lack of ball security. He gets hit, he fumbles, that's not great. And then later we see an interception where he throws the ball high. It, it's a completable pass. Ball goes high, gets picked off. It's Daniel Jones shooting himself in the foot. He uh, had two turnovers on the night, both came in the fourth quarter, in a position to tie the game. And that it's, I mean, I don't know how, I think everyone's out on Daniel Jones, but I, I don't know how you possibly, like, where I don't know where you move forward with him anymore. I, I, I guess really at this point, you're two and six. You play Washington next at home. That feels like another loss. You're two and seven before you play Carolina and Tampa. Tampa's down with some injuries. Carolina's bad. If you're a Giants fan at this point, I think you're rooting for a two or three win season and just giving yourself a shot to find a new quarterback next year. Cause that's the only way I think you fix this is you got to restart a quarterback. I don't know if Brian Dable makes it through to next year. I think they let it the year play out. The giants are not a team that's quick to fire. Um, they try to be honorable and they're very milk toast in that way. They don't, they don't have this <laughs> big, you know, loud personality in, in New York with the big blue. Um, but I don't know that we see Brian Dable next year coaching for the giants. And I think it's, he was brought in hoping he could save Daniel Jones and it looked really good year one. And since then it's been an erosion of just worse and worse quarterback play from Daniel Jones. Some of that's on him. Some of that's on the coach. And I'm not sure that he's going to make it to a chance with the next, another quarterback, honestly. Yeah. I, I don't think he will either. And I think he's got some ability as a head coach, but I just, if your quarterback position isn't good and isn't consistent, it's going to be very, very hard to win football games. When your quarterback is handing the ball over to the other team, it's going to be tough to win games. My hot take is I think that Brian Dayball could end up in two different places. One, I think the Seahawks will ultimately move on from Ryan Grubb. We can talk about that later, potentially. I think they move on from Ryan Grubb, and that is a potential spot for Dayball to go. You get a veteran quarterback in Geno Smith. Uh, you get a number of weapons, and Dayball has proven that he's a guy who knows how to scheme some of his best players open and get guys who are talented in space with the football. Um, that's one space. And then the next space I could see is potentially being a head coach in Dallas. We'll see what oh. happens with Mike McCarthy at the end of this year. But I could see Dayball kind of this. I see him and Jerry Jones having a similar personality. And I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. Uh, but I could really see Dayball ending up in Dallas. The Game Time app is the best place to find NBA tickets. On the Game Time app, you will find affordable tickets that are easy to buy, and here is what the Game Time app does for you. Number one, they've got the Game Time Picks feature, which allows for curation that makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and other events. They've got all-in pricing. We're toggling this feature. Shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. There are seat views where you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. Game Time has a lowest price guarantee, or Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference and game time has ticket coverage where your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Download the game time app, create an account and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem with the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. Another place I could see Brian Dable is in Massachusetts with the Patriots, actually. He brought along uh, Josh Allen in Buffalo. There's another really talented guy, Drake May, I think would be really interesting with Brian Dable. Now, I don't know that Alex Van Pelt's on the hot seat in New England. I think they like him. He's yeah. actually done a pretty good job bringing along Drake May. But if that job does come open, I think Brian Dable could land in New England as well. Um, I, I don't... When I look back on the Daniel Jones, we'll call it a failure, I guess. A massive contract, a lack of success there. I, there's definitely no excuse you can really give him. He was given a good offensive head coach. Um, and they they tried basically every every iteration of team they could build around him. He never had a great team. I want to say that very fairly about Daniel Jones. He never had like what Dak Prescott's had for a lot of years in Dallas with a good offensive sure. line, a running back, and star receivers. But he's had something every year you could kind of lean your, you know, and hang your hat on, whether it's Saquon Barkley or Malik Neighbors. He's certainly not had nothing either. Um and it's consistently not worked. And really the bigger problem with Daniel Jones is his ceiling is really low. His potential is really limited. I think yeah. on his best day, he's Alex Smith. And like, okay, but there's a, a massive problem that just no matter, even the best of Daniel Jones is probably not going to take you very far. Um, I, I really empathize today. If you're a New York sports fan, the Mets and the uh, Jets go brutal. together. 
and the Yankees and the Giants tend to go together. So if you're a Giants fan, you're also probably a Yankees fan. You watch the Yankees basically no show in a World Series game today uh, on the bats. Terrible hitting from their best players. I, really, the whole series has been. And then you look at the Giants and go, man, we're two and six. Our quarterback is a disaster. We lost again. In a crucial moment, our quarterback let us down. Basically, all the star players, if you're a Giants and Yankees fan, your star players in crucial moments tonight let you down. What a rough Monday night for New York sports. I just feel like, oh, that's got to <laughs> hurt a lot. Not how you want to start your week. No, but dude, it's only Monday. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a tough scene. A tough scene in New York. Uh, let's, let's shift gears if you want. I'd, I'd like to to Kansas City, actually. We'll talk about the best teams in the AFC. I, I wanted to actually talk about the Browns-Ravens. We'll get to that next. But I think the best place to start is with Kansas City because as we talk about the AFC generally, every other team is going to be in reference to Kansas City. So I don't have a lot to say, but the Chiefs are 7-0. and They beat the Raiders 27-20. Yep. to Travis Kelsey just had 10 catches for 90 yards and a touchdown. That's the headline. Kansas City is 7-0, and despite all the criticism, despite all the this mm-hmm. and that and injuries and figure th- figuring things out. Every week, this team finds a way. And uh, until proven otherwise, the gold standard in the NFL right now is Kansas City. Is it yeah. flashy? No. Is it sexy? No. Are they blowing people out? Definitely not. But they're finding a way to win every single week. What do you make of Kansas City being 7-0 at this point of the year? What I make is their inability to move the focal point of the offense around from week to week in order to win Mm. the football game. Recently, Mm. right now, it's been Kareem Hunt. He's had 20-plus carries every single day. Not every single day. Every single game that he has been there. with the, He might be getting 21 totes in practice. Nobody knows. We're not in there. (laughs) Um, But he's getting 20-plus carries, and they're really, really leaning on the run game, similar to what they were doing with with Pacheco, but I think even more so uh, with Kareem Hunt. Um, this addition of DeAndre Hopkins, like we talked about, opened up the middle of the field a little bit. We saw Xavier Worthy get over the top. And like I was talking about these trail plays where DeAndre Hopkins can kind of follow Xavier Worthy. That was DeAndre Hopkins' first catch of the game. Xavier Worthy explodes out. DeAndre Hopkins following right behind him, 16-yard gain. It was super awesome to see. And then we saw Travis Kelsey get loose. All of a sudden, you add one guy who's an elite pass catcher who can play inside and outside. That just gives you another target to look at. And so Travis Kelsey gets out of prison on tight end day. That was just also all of the tight ends this weekend went absolutely bananas. You could have started like four tight ends on your fantasy team and won a game. It would have been nuts. Um, But yeah, that's, that's Kansas City. They are so... What, what's the word that I'm Versatile. looking for? Yeah, yeah, versatile. I was trying to find like a really scientific word, like metamorphosis, even though that wasn't the right word. They're they're <laughs> they're chameleons, right? They can be who they need to be to win the game. Mm. Um, again, their their defense played solid. I don't think this was their defense's best outing. Um, I think that the Vegas Raiders were trying a little bit harder in division game, not wanting to be embarrassed by doing the whole Kermit the Frog thing earlier this year, so they had a little bit more momentum. Um, yeah, that's just Kansas City. They are excellent at being who they need to be to win football games. That's why they're seven and zero, and that's why it's hard to see any losses on their schedule. Yeah, I look. I don't. It's really hard to look at this team and say they're going to go seventeen and zero. But then you look at their schedule and you go, well, there are a lot of cupcakes. I mean, and the teams they've played, right? They they got really lucky too. They played Atlanta before they figured out. They played a down Cincinnati team. They beat the Ravens week one before they'd really figured stuff out. It seems like. Um, Chargers, Saints were injured. The 49ers banged up. The Raiders are not a great team. But then the rest of their schedule, Denver. So the couple couple dangerous teams, I'll mention these first. Buffalo is, is rough. At Buffalo in November, not great. Uh, at Pittsburgh at the end of the year is not great. Houston at the end of the year, not great. At Cleveland. But they're all winnable games too. I mean, I Pittsburgh's sure like solid, but definitely a game that Kansas City can win. Buffalo has looked vulnerable at times. Uh, the Browns certainly, they're two, they're two and six, right? They just beat Baltimore, mm-hmm. but, and I like their defense. I like some of the things they've got going on the field, but certainly Kansas City can beat Cleveland. It's going to come down to whether they lose a weird game like the Raiders the second time or at Denver week 18 or something like that. But certainly, as weird as it sounds, it's not sexy. It's not, you know, mm-hmm. been blowing you away, but there's a chance Kansas City does go undefeated. I don't think that happens. That's not my prediction at all. But the rest of their schedule is incredibly winnable games from here on out. And it's like, man, I 
I just got to tip a cap. It's been a really incre- impressive year for Kansas City, in my opinion. If they go undefeated and win the Super Bowl and the Super Bowl is the three-peat, that'd be amazing. That won't they're, happen, no, right? I mean, they're going to find a way to lose. It seems like they right? won't find a lose. They always find a way to win. They don't yeah. find a way. They're not. They're not the Chargers. They're not the Jets. They're not the yeah. Seahawks. They're not. Uh, who else can we toss in there? Uh, the Ravens right now. They don't find ways to lose games. They find ways to win games, and that's what makes them so special. I guess what I want to say though is I don't want people to mistake me. I don't think this team goes undefeated. That's a weird like just you're never gonna have a prediction from me. It's hard. It's hard in the NFL. But it it's also it's really hard to find a loss for Kansas City. You're like, man, I at this point, given what they've done, given what they continue to do, the rest of their schedule just looks really, really um manageable, in my opinion. It does. And there's were they did just acquire another linebacker as well from the mm-hmm. Patriots. Why am I blanking on the gentleman's name? He's probably Second been one pick. of the yeah. yeah he, his he's been too. one of he's been one of their best players defensively this year. So that's another addition to shore up that defense. Um, yeah, they're they're doing the right things. That's what they do. The right things. Let's talk about another great team in the AFC. Um, <laughs> the Browns beat the Ravens twenty nine to twenty four this past weekend. Mm. Uh, it's really interesting to me. I think it's very. I don't, the word is almost suspect that the first game without Deshaun Watson, Cleveland comes out, looks really good and beats one of the best teams, in the AFC, the Baltimore mm-hmm. Ravens, Jameis Winston, their quarterback, 27 or 41 passing 334 yards, three touchdowns. He did have a fumble, but is it not a bit weird? One game without Deshaun Watson, suddenly the Browns look like a competent football team. Like they can beat anyone. It is a little bit suspicious, I'm not going to lie, especially when you are so effective through the air. 330 yards, three touchdowns, Jameis yeah. Winston. You know he's going to sling the rock, right? It is. They just traded away Amari Cooper. They got rid of him, and they're better. It does feel, but this, this is one thing I'll say for the Ravens. Number one, the Ravens' defense isn't what they are, and I think there is one reason for that. I think there's two players where they lost physicality. They lost Patrick Queen, and they lost Jadavion Kelly. Jadavion Clowney, you know, for what it's worth, he's still a very effective football player. He's not the superstar he was promised to be, but he is a great NFL starter. They lost those two guys, part of their front seven. Losing that physicality has really hurt not just the scheme of this defense, but I think the mentality, right? Mm. These these hard nosed, the you know, you think about the the Ray Lewis's, you think about Terrell Suggs, they've lost that physical edge. And I think those two guys played critical roles in that. And without those guys, I feel like they're just lacking a little bit on defense. Um, but, but going back to the Browns, let's let's applaud them for the offense that they put out there. Number one, you don't know what you're going to see with Jameis. That's entirely new. But again, I've talked about it for the past two weeks. This Browns defense is still very good, and they're getting healthy. So despite Lamar Jackson being as great as he is and as well as he played, you can't – they do a better job of slowing him down than other teams making it difficult and then Lamar yep. also did not get a lot of help from a few receivers there were some ugly drops out there um I kind of jumped all over the place there but the the point I want to make here is the Ravens have lost physicality um and the Browns are finding like you said that that new spark they feel like when they're going out there their defense if they get a turnover or if they get a short field they get a punt that their offense can go down and score on their behalf. And that's what creates the complimentary football. So when the guys are coming off the sideline, it's not, man, fuck you like you, you can't even score for me. It's excuse my language. It's hey, like, yo, go get one for us. Or we're going to get that ball back for you versus, bro, we're about to send Deshaun out there, go three and out. And we're going to be back out there again. That was a big problem with the Browns defense early. They were on the field a lot. What I will say, you know, Jameis comes out, has three touchdowns. Frankie looks pretty good. That happens from time to time, though. We saw the Carolina Panthers bench Bryce Young. Next week, Andy Dalton comes in. You, like, breathe new life into it. For one week, the team looks really good. It seems like that always happens. You yeah. get an emotional push when you make a big change in your your franchise. It doesn't seem very sustainable. We'll see if that is the case with Cleveland. They're 2-6. and six, Their year's probably over. But I would be – I think it's it's really – interesting if Jameis Winston plays really well the rest of the year and and just calls it'd be the second year in a row Deshaun's gotten hurt and the backup has come in 
and played significantly better. If if that is mm. sustainable, and Jameis Winston plays really good the rest of the year, you have Joe Flacco last year, who is better than Deshaun Watson by a mile, mm-hmm. and then if Jameis comes in and plays this way the rest of the year, you go, it's so obvious. You're paying the wrong guy. You're keeping the wrong guy in the field, and you're just shooting yourself in the foot. And it's at some point, it's got to get to the point where it's blatant and obvious and you can't roll with it anymore. You can't keep putting a Sean Watson on the field if every backup comes yeah. in and does better than him. So I don't know that it's sustainable. I don't know that it's going to be Jameis Winston's a star player from here on out. But if that does happen, you you can't have it be the second year in a row. You have a, a guy come in and do better and then still go back to Deshaun Watson for the next year. It's like that. that's the definition of insanity. He's doing that same thing over and over again. Yeah, and unfortunately, they're trapped by that contract. And I guarantee, despite Deshaun or despite Jameis Winston's performance, they would roll out Deshaun Watson again next year, which is an unfortunate thought to have, knowing how much production you can get by going with literally anybody other than Deshaun Watson. I will say for Jameis Winston, this is what his ninth year in the league, ninth approaching 10. So he's been around. He's been a veteran. He's seen a lot of football and he probably now has a better understanding than the time when he was in Tampa early. Uh, He got two years of quarterback rehab with Sean Payton before Sean Payton moved on. So he's got more football IQ than he previously had in his career. And I do wonder if that will pay off for him. And we're not just going to see the you know, one game of brilliance like we did with Andy Dalton. But yeah, I think that this has a chance to be sustainable. Yeah, you look at five years in Tampa, you have that incredible year. We have 33 touchdowns, but 30 interceptions. Four years in New Orleans. Now he's in Cleveland. So that I guess that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is year 10 for James. Yeah. And we we are seeing a resurgence of guys who, I mean, that's kind of the lost generation is quarterbacks who are in there. That's the same rough age Mariota is, that that 30-year-old quarterback. I don't know if he plays well enough to get a job, but like I look at the Giants, for example, probably need a quarterback next year. Maybe they bring in a Jameis Winston to be their Tyrod Taylor type guy to be mm. the mentor until the young guy they draft inevitably is ready to go. I think Jameis is going to have that role from this point on in his career is he's a veteran to bring along the young kid, but... Uh, the same way Mariota is doing with Jaden Daniels in Washington with the Commanders. Yeah, but I, I'm really curious if Jameis can play really well and get himself a contract somewhere else next year. That's kind of I'm, I find myself rooting for that because he seems like a really interesting, compelling guy. And I've said for years that after Jameis retires, I just want him to go to like Italy and have a TV show. Just he's the most entertaining. Do you see the video pre game where he's like, "Play for the the." Words on your helmet or something. It's like, we, we actually, we have no decals. Wait, so actually, it's like, we don't have decals. So. Play for that name on your helmet. Actually, wait a minute. We don't even have decals. It's so funny, dude. He's the most unintentionally funny human in football. And uh, I, I don't know. I just, I think he's actually more akin to Marshawn Lynch. Where like, just put that guy in front of a camera and let him be himself. And you're going to find great entertainment value. Great locker room guy. Great locker yeah. room guy. Uh, and look, he had a touchdown pass, 59 seconds left against the Ravens. That's a big I'm throw to that deep ball. I believe it's a Cedric Tillman. We we're like, man, that's a, uh, that's, that's a big move right there. There's money. Let's, I want to talk about Baltimore compared to Buffalo, but before we do that, let's just talk about Buffalo, then circle back to Baltimore. If that's okay. Cause sure. we should have a larger conversation about the Ravens and, and the bills. The bills beat Seattle 31 to 10 this past weekend. Oof. The bills are now six and two. And my question for you, Nathan is, does that victory over Seattle change the way you view them at all? Yes and no. Hmm. We continue to see this balanced approach from, from the Bills, right? They're better in the run game. They're able to produce 100-yard receivers. Josh Allen isn't having to do it all yeah. in these last two games that we've seen. But earlier in the year, first four or five games, Josh Allen had to be that superhero. And now we're starting to see a little bit more balance come through. And I think that that is helping uh, Amari Cooper, obviously being in the building. And then we saw Keon Coleman's best game. So I think that, yes, you know what? I'm going to stop dancing around it. I'm going to upgrade the Buffalo Bills. I'm not putting them in the contender territory. I'm putting putting them in the dark horse territory. But again, Hmm. I do love what they're doing offensively. And I have a lot of faith in Joe Brady and Josh Allen combination to put together an offensive performance that's capable of winning against any football team in the NFL. My concern still resides with the defense, which is shocking to say. Um, But I think in this game against Seattle, what we saw was a true coaching mismatch. 
Mike McDonald, young, young defensive guy, Sean McDermott, older defensive guy who's been around the block. But more importantly, you had Ryan Grubb, first time offensive coordinator in the NFL against Sean McDermott. And Ryan Grubb was playing without DK Metcalf. And it's clear that he did not have an offensive plan that was going to work when DK Metcalf was not the featured wide receiver. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kenneth Walker. I can't remember how many rushing yards. I want to say like 40 something rushing yards. If that they could not run the rock at all, which is surprising against the Buffalo's defense, which has generally you've been able to run the football against. Um, So I think the coaching mismatch was huge, but that again speaks to the capability of Sean McDermott. So you have a great defensive guy and you've got Joe Brady and Josh Allen. That is such a great combination for them. Um, Yes. Again, upgraded to contender, but I'm still just not sold on the defense being able to make the plays when they need to make them. Yeah, Seattle ran the ball 17 times for 32 yards. Their leading rusher was Geno Smith with five carries and 16 yards on the day. So they got shut down in the running game. Um, I, how do I say this? Um, I'm, I'm curious for you, with the AFC, you've got Kansas City as the clear number one, in my opinion. They're 7-0. and And it's not even necessarily they look that impressive. It's that they're Kansas City. You have to also remember the context of the past. They've won two Super Bowls in a row. Have they been the most impressive 7-0 team I've ever seen? No, but they're also the team we've seen for years, Kansas City. So they have to be first, in my opinion. Agreed. But then the question is, who, who follows Kansas City? Is it Baltimore? Is it Buffalo? The only other team in the mix is maybe Houston. Is Buffalo a top three team in the AFC? And then if, if yes, who do you take? Who's more Who's more impressive to you, the Ravens or the Bills, and why? To me, the Ravens are more impressive, and I think offensively they have more pow- firepower. And defensively, they have enough playmakers. Again, I'd like to point out Kyle Hamilton. is yeah. a guy who's physical in the run game, and he's a ball hawk. I think he's an absolute game changer. But on the Bills side of the football, Teron Johnson is turning out to be a very – great player in his own right on their back end. But I still think I'd give that nod to the Ravens. I have more faith in John Harbaugh and that coaching staff than I do in Sean McDermott in those big spots. I'm giving, I'm giving the Ravens the nod over the bills for the same reason that Kansas city is getting the nod over the Ravens, just a little bit more faith in the most recent history. And I think the Ravens have looked like a more complete team. um, Although not by, you know, a ton They've just looked like a more complete team to me running the football and Lamar is, you know, playing some of his best ball right now. Would you say it's pretty close between I, I'm really, you know, we saw the Ravens lose 35 to 10 when they played Baltimore week four. So it's they've, they have matched up, uh, but that's before adding Amari Cooper. That's before, you know, more development from Keon Coleman, the rookie receiver. Right. Who, I, I really who wonder if these teams week. rematch in the playoffs, which feels inevitable between Buffalo and Baltimore. Does Baltimore make it a better game than last time they played? I, I think yes, but I, I'm kind of I kind of line with you. I think Baltimore is a better team, although I just don't discount the development we're seeing from Buffalo. I, yeah. I thought we we really were looking for a lot from Buffalo and Seattle in this game, and Buffalo really took a step forward. Seattle did. just didn't grab our attention at all. It's like ah, all right, well we know who's who now. Yeah. I think and that's one of the things when Seattle was 4 and 0 everyone was like oh my goodness Seattle like they're one of the great teams they they could be great this year are they are they on fraud watch and we were like yes they are on fraud watch their roster I don't think is deep enough while they have excellent players on both sides of the football and like I talked about the coaching mismatch uh, for Seattle yeah. kind of brought them down um but yeah you you brought it up and what the big part about why the Ravens were able to blow out the Bills is running the football with Derrick Henry, just absolutely taking the life out of that team. And I think that that's going to be the killer in the matchup. Like I talked about, this Bills defense, and I'm sure that they've gotten better since that matchup, right, defending the run. But the Ravens have gotten better using Derrick Henry as well, albeit last game was an anomaly with sometimes games are just weird in division games. Um yeah, I, I give the nod to the Ravens here. Uh, I think Zay Flowers is continuing to develop. I think this might be a second or third game in a row with over 100 yards receiving. Uh, Rashad Bateman, outside of the drop that literally hit him in the chest, uh, has been looking great. Mark Andrews is having a revival now. He's starting to get healthy after that broken ankle. I think he's really starting to trend up. Yeah, I just I have a lot more faith in this Ravens football team. I will say 
both teams have a superstar quarterback, whether it's Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson, which is yeah. why, like, I, I think at a big moment, we're primed for potentially a really fun, fo- a fun football game. Now, I it also thought the World epic. Series is going to be interesting and exciting, and it's been a total dud. I thought, hey, great players everywhere, and one team's just dominated. So maybe we'll see another 35-10 game if the Ravens play Buffalo. But I'm hoping for them to play a playoff game against each other. I think it'd be really compelling and fun. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we'll see a blowout game and again. That addition of Mar- Amari Cooper, what it's going to do to the Ravens' defense? You can't stack that box and just say Khalil Shakir. Like you can do whatever you want. Like however many yeah. yards you get, it doesn't really matter. Actually, I don't even think he was playing in that matchup. He might have been injured at the time. Yeah, um, yeah. I think they were missing their. We talked about it. Missing yeah, their number one receiver. Their number and you're one like, red. Oh yeah, number one. Okay, we're real scared over here. Sorry to sorry to disrespect him. He did have over 100 yards receiving this week, so shout out to him. Yeah. Um, but what Amari Cooper again can do to a defense, linebackers can't commit to that run game as quickly, um, and it just it will be easier for Buffalo to run the football the second time around. And obviously, you've added another receiving weapon, and like we've talked about, the development of Keon Coleman. He's starting to play fast, and he's starting to play with confidence, and that is going to be scary for other teams. I want to make something clear. You respect. Khalil Shakur. He's just not Justin Jefferson, right? He's not like a true, he's not DeAndre Hopkins, what DeAndre Hopkins has been. He's not Tyree Kill. He's not a true number one guy. Correct. He's, he's a guy who probably needs other people across the on the other side from him uh, to really get the most out of his career. And that's that's yeah. respectable. He's got a hundred yards. He's gonna have a great long career. I think they love him at Buffalo, but um he's just not like I, I think what they were hoping he would be when the year started. I mean, there's a reason they traded for Murray Cooper. They were hoping Khalil Shakur could be the number one guy, and they've ultimately had to kind of accept, yeah, we need a little more help here. Yeah. Again, he is a, a very talented player, but, you know, in baseball, since we're talking about baseball a lot, you got your five tool guys, the guys that can hit, they can feel, they can pitch, whatever, right? Shakir is not your, your five tool wide receiver. And like you said, he's not the Jamar Chase, the Justin Jefferson, the guys who can do it all from every position on the field. Uh, while I do think that he's also shown growth this year, um, I think his physical he hits home runs, man. He really he hit, does. He hits he hits homes run. Hit, wow, hits home runs. But as far as contested catches and those other parts of being a wide receiver um, that take you to that upper echelon, I think that without a quarterback like Josh Allen, he could fade into nothingness. Again, this is no disrespect to him and his ta- his talent and his ability, but Josh Allen can make guys look really, really good. Amari Cooper is also 30 years old. I, I think actually having him in the building with Keon Coleman is going to be really good for the development of Keon Coleman. I think it's going to bring, because ultimately where you're hoping Buffalo goes is that two, three years from now, Keon Coleman's their number one receiver, the guy they're in love with, I think is awesome. Yeah. Um, he can develop into a true number one receiver. He's not there yet, but I think the influence of Amari Cooper could help him along in that process. What say you? Amari Cooper has probably said, 50 words total to Keon Coleman. He's a, he's a quiet, he's a shy guy. I'm exaggerating with 50 words. Sure. But those 50 words are probably the most important words that Keon Coleman has ever heard, just in terms of the experience and the understanding. Those things we talked about, understanding when it's time to sit in the zone, uh, when it's time to keep going because it's man, when you need to stair step when you're coming across the middle, and when you need to kind of come more downhill. Like There's just so many things to learn from the wide receiver position that you're only going to get from a guy who's been there. Amari Cooper is a guy who's been there and Keon Coleman is a guy who is going there. I think theoretically too, Amari Cooper can say nothing and still have a tremendous impact on Amari Cooper just by example, by watching how a pro does it, watching how he gets off the ball, watching releases, watching the little nuance of how he plays the game. I just think, Keon Coleman, the same way we see Justin Fields actually leaning into being around Russell Wilson and taking a second fiddle, we could see Keon Coleman really learn a lot from a guy like Amari Cooper. Did you see Russ and, and Justin kind of laughing on the sideline at the end of the game? Yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. I thought no, they cool. seem like they've got a great relationship, man. It's really, um, I think it really speaks to the maturity of Justin Fields, though, to realize, hey, he's even said it. Like when he got benched, he was really honest. said, look, if I play better, probably not a conversation. And, and now he's just saying, like, look, I think everything happens for a reason. I want to take everything I can and learn everything I can and get myself ready for next the next opportunity I get. He just seems to be taking this in stride and wanting to learn from Russ and just develop as a player best he possibly can. And I think we're seeing humility from Justin Fields, which is 
man, it's a, it's a really hard thing at a really young age to, to develop. Um, not that he didn't already, it's not how I meant that, but my point is like to, to be a, a first round pick, to be viewed as a franchise quarterback, then get benched and then have your shot, then get it taken away from you a second time. You give it to Russell Wilson. It'd be really easy to be bitter and angry and not sit by Russ, not get along with him. I've been a, a quarterback who lost my job. I've been a quarterback who wasn't picked to be the starter. Dude, you hate the guy who takes your job. You hate the guy who's on the field more yeah. than you. For him to have the maturity to go, you know what? I'm going to take this for what it is, learn what I can, and try to grow from it is really, really, I think, he's got vision for the long-term future of his career. Um, exactly. And that's really, really cool to see for Justin Fields. Yeah, that's exactly it. He understands that humility is needed to get that next job. If he's sitting there getting up at the mic, screaming about how he should be starting and da-da-da, nobody's going to want to bring him into their locker room next year. But I guarantee there's a lot of GMs around the league that may or may not be quarterback needy or may want a very quality backup, right? A quality backup is so important. We saw that with Marcus Mariota last week. Having a quality backup, uh, Joe Flacco, right? Having that quality quarterback is important, and I know that there are GMs looking at Justin Fields like, man, if we could get him in here, that would be huge for us. We saw the need for a quality backup this year in Pittsburgh, I believe. Right? Like, <laughs> you know I, what I mean? I like, guess so. I guess truly, so. like I, I actually, the more I see Russ play well, I go, oh, he, he's got it. So. I just think he wasn't ready week one and then they win and they're like, well, let's drag along this quote unquote rehab process with Russ. And I, I think by the end, Russ was healthy, maybe a little bit before he got back on the field. But truly, I don't think Russ was healthy week one. Um, and Justin Fields pulled him out of a bind. Honestly, I think by, you know, starting four and two best possible outcome for them. Um, I don't give up on the fact that Justin Fields could become a franchise quarterback. Still, I think maybe even in Pittsburgh, if he's really smart, I, I want to play for Mike Tomlin. If I was a player, if I'm a quarterback, you get a better offer somewhere else, great. Go be the Giants. But I think Pittsburgh sets you up to succeed, honestly, by sitting behind Russ for a year or two, growing, developing. They're a different kind of franchise that is very loyal, that wants people to be there. Um, and I, I think there's a process of the torch could get passed if Justin wants to resign in Pittsburgh. And there's a timeline here where he ends up the guy a couple years from now in Pittsburgh still. <laughs> I want whatever you're smoking right, right. now. No, uh, I, don't, I don't. I don't mean to hate on that take, but uh, it would be it'd be interesting to see. But I don't think his. I don't think his spot is in Pittsburgh. Sure, I don't know uh, where it's at. I just don't think Pittsburgh. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app. Use Prize Picks while you watch NFL games this fall because making picks makes watching games more engaging. And you could turn something like $5 into $50. Price Picks offers quick and easy deposits. You can even use Apple Pay. So put your skills to the test in daily fantasy. Go to pricepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That is pricepicks.com slash CLNS using code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, daily fantasy made easy. I want to save you from commenters. People will say this, I'm sure. The Seahawks didn't start 4 0. They started 3 0. Someone's going to say that. I know what you meant. They started 3 0, then they lost three in a row. Um, let's talk about the NFC West, though. Right now, you've got Arizona, the 49ers, and Seattle all at 4 and 4. And then you have the Rams at 3 and 4. I watched the Rams on Thursday night football against Minnesota. They look like a whole different football team with Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. Like suddenly, Matthew Stafford throws four touchdowns. He's throwing the ball all over the yard. They look really, really good. And you're like, hey, the Rams were a game away from, you know, a loss away from being two and five in their season over. Instead, they're three and four. Their season is alive. They're a game back in the division. Frankly, the Rams could still win this whole thing in the NFC West. What do you make of the NFC West? The 49ers are banged up. They're surviving. They're four and mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. honestly the rams are the most promising team in the division currently the most healthy they're getting their groove back what do you make of that thought could the rams still win it like what do you make of the nfc west in general right now that's so funny because last week i was saying last two weeks i was like yeah we probably got to down downgrade the rams here but what you saw on thursday night football was two things the minnesota vikings had just played the lions got beat up highly emotional game yeah. followed up against a rams team that is number one at home number two getting back cooper cup and getting back Puka Nakua, and you still have Kyron Williams. 
those three-headed monsters from a receiving standpoint. And that's before we even talk about Kyron Williams, his ability to rush the football. He had a number of 100-yard games this year without having any sort of receivers on the back end to help unload that box, right? Yeah. Super impressive. Um, but what we saw was the Rams offense we were thought we were going to see this entire year. Just dynamic. Uh, zone beaters, man beaters, running the football, uh, play action, having no real read of what they're doing. And that's what makes them so dynamic. And of course, you've got Matt Stafford heading it all up, uh, knowing where to go with the football and delivering the football on time and on trajectory. Like This is the Rams team that we expected to see. Now, defensively, I'm not sure if we just got a stinker from the Vikings or if, you know, Jared first is really starting to heat up. I know that they Christian Darasaw went out um, at some point in that game. And then all of a sudden the Rams started getting pressure. Darnold got a little bit uncomfortable, but the defense has started to step up this younger defense. And if they can start to put a few games like that on tape and accompany that with this offense, which I'm not sure who is going to stop this offense going forward. Just watch out for the Rams. And in a microcosm of the rest of the division, I think we're going to see a lot of the same things. We're going to see some up and down from Seattle. They're going to have some good games and bad games, inconsistent. We're going to see the same thing from Arizona. And then the Niners, I just, I've got faith still that they're going to get this ship righted, finish in the red zone, and, and put teams away so it's not scary. But man, what... This division, yes, to me, is wide open, and it looks like the Rams do have an opportunity here to to sneak in and grab it. The, I mean, Niners, the, year, the Niners had a chance to run away with it. Not yeah. quite literally because they haven't played all their division matchups, yeah. but the Niners had a chance uh, early in this year to kind of stamp themselves as the team in that division. And for injuries and multitude of other reasons, they just did not do that. No, I, I think when the year started, we talked about the Rams and the 49ers as the two teams that are, are going to win this division, you know, compete for this division. We're right back to that spot again. We're like, hey, one of these two teams, I don't know who's going to duke it out and win, but um, man, the Rams feel like they got a really good shot. The next game, the Rams play. I just want to say something real quick as well. Stafford was getting sacked three, four, five times a game to start this year. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden with Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup, and you got guys you can get the ball out to, you got a clean sheet. Like it makes it so much easier on the offensive line to protect Stafford when number one, he can get rid of the football on time because guys are open. But number two, you can't send as many guys in pressure because Stafford can get rid of it. And because you've still got to deal with Kyron Williams out of the backfield, like it just this team gets better, obviously, with those two in. And it's not just their ability to catch the football. It's how they affect the remainder of the defense. Those mm-hmm. safeties got to sit a little bit higher. Those linebackers got to be a little bit more patient uh, before committing to the run. The corners have to worry, oh, shit, do I have to match up with Cooper Cup right now one-on-one? <laughs> Is he about to break me off over the middle? Like All of those things start to get into a defensive psyche when you're that healthy as a team. I want to say this about... Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, you know, Puka, for example, had a really great catch down the sideline on Thursday night that I was like, whoa, dude, I forgot. I just forgot like how good this dude is. Both these guys can win a one-on-one matchup. It's not, they're not the best one-on-one guys in the league, but certainly they can win a one-on-one matchup. But on top of that, and they're very similar players and that Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup are really, really smart. They know how to read defense. It's very similar to the way a quarterback coach. They recognize, hey, we're stacked. It's cover four. We're stacked. It's cover two. They understand what zone they're seeing. They understand what the defense is doing to them, which allows them to find windows and get open. We saw Van Jefferson should have been open in the end zone tonight on Monday Night Football, and he wasn't because he didn't read the defense they were giving him. Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup don't do that. They read the defense. They find windows constantly, which makes it easier for Matthew Stafford to get the ball out of his hands quickly. A, he can throw it against man coverage because we got guys who can win, but also against zone coverage, he's got guys turning their chest to the quarterback, getting their head around, and looking for the football um, and that's that's going to really help Matthew Stafford avoid sacks as well, which is the ability to get the ball out of his hands quickly. Absolutely. Let's talk about the 49ers. Uh, they beat Dallas 30 to 24 on Sunday Night Football. <sighs> I I want to say this is a weird weird thought about this game, but I, I saw a lot of narratives. It's been so long since both these teams have won a Super Bowl. I hate they're getting compared because one team has been in the Super Bowl a couple times recently. And the other team, the Cowboys, hasn't been in a Super Bowl since the 90s. I don't, mm. these two things are not equal. No, it's been <laughs> since the 90s. These two teams have won a Super Bowl. No. Technically, but like one has been really close. One has not been close at all. I, I hate that that got compared to a lot during this game on Sunday Night Football. But 
I, I liked what I saw from the 49ers. I think Ricky Pearsall's coming along. They're not healthy yet, but Brock Purdy is look, he's not the best quarterback in the world. Mm-hmm. I I do think he's got something similar to Drew Brees in that he's he's not a great athlete, but he's good enough. He ran for a couple yards in this game. He's getting the ball out really quick. He's got a very average to maybe even below average arm, but he's really accurate at times. He missed the throw mm-hmm. open to George Kittle. Ball was high. Should have been a, a first down. He did little stuff wrong, but all in all, I, I really like Brock. I think he does enough good stuff to, to keep him and be happy with him. I don't know what to make of the 49ers. What, what do you make of this win? What do you make of this team moving forward? What do you make of this game in general? This win is really, really scary for the Niners because this has been their problem all year. If they do get a lead in the fourth quarter, I believe they've given up two of those games already, but they're not yeah. putting teams away. They haven't you know, delivered the final blow to really make a team like Dallas quit. And I got to tip the cap to Dallas here. <laughs> their fight there in the second half when things really, really yeah. look dead, a big shout out to them for hanging around, you know, Dak and CD making the special plays. Um, well, they were down 27 to 10. I mean, that yeah. they really fought to get back into this game. They did. But the problem is, is, is Brock Purdy outrushed you by himself. And that's a problem. But, but back to this Niners team, they're a well-coached team. Um, they're plug and play. And they just are missing their, their octane, that juice. You know, that, you know, that boost, uh, What's the game? I feel like Need uh, for midnight, Speed, and you hit Midnight. Cl- yes, mid- yeah. there it is. Need for Speed, Midnight Club Dub Edition. You hit the, you hit the nitrous or whatever it is, and that final gear that just makes you go and you can separate. Christian McCaffrey is a guy that brings that to them, but again, like they are so talented elsewhere, and Brock Purdy is more than a good enough quarterback to continue to win these football games. And it's not always going to be pretty. I think Brock Purdy has looked a little bit less settled this year. Um, hence, you know, interceptions are up a few more mistakes, but that's also due to the fact that his receiving room has been a, a rotating door of healthy, unhealthy, uh, Jennings in out Debo in out Kittle banged up knee in out, just all of these different things. And they really haven't had a chance to, you know, be a complete team together. And I think down the back stretch of the season, we'll see that. And now they have the battle scars too. If it comes time to a playoff game and they've got to close out a game or they've got to come from behind, I've got full full faith that they can do that. I want to I want to speak to that. You, you said because everyone talks about Brock Purdy's not the same without his star players in the receiving room, and that's been true. But maybe not for the reason we think. Like obviously, if you're missing your star receivers, that's hard. But it's also just the ask, lack of just consistency. Ask Matt Stafford. <laughs> oh. It's hard. But it's, it's also, these are guys, you're then throwing to people you haven't been getting number one reps with all year in training camp and preparing for. You didn't prepare to play with these guys, so now you have guys who, they're not reading defense as well, so not getting their head around. The same thing we saw, you're right, with the Rams and Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. It's not just that he's not as good, so playing with worse players is struggling. It's that, hey, uh, I'm playing with guys that don't know the offense as well. I'm playing with people that don't know exactly what spot they're supposed to be in every time. Yeah. I'm throwing the ball to the spot where Debo Samuel will be, but that's not Debo Samuel running that route. So the guy's in the wrong spot. I hit my marker. The ball's in the right spot. Receiver's not there. It's yeah. little things like that. It's it's not as simple as just because I'm playing with out my star players means I suck too. It's like, no, it's also, we're not on the same page here. That Your playbook shrinks when you don't have your top tier guys because obviously those are things you haven't worked on and they're typically things you haven't worked on with those other guys because they can't execute it. All due yeah. respect to, you know, Jordan Masek and Isaac Garendo. Garendo had stepped up and had a very great game. They can't do the things that McCaffrey can do. Therefore, the motions and the lining McCaffrey up outside and inside it or having McCaffrey and Debo in the backfield motioning one of them out. All of those little dynamic things that have made it so hard on the defense, you aren't able to do like if you put Ricky Pierce Hall in the backfield everyone's like what are you doing right so there's yeah. these different things that change the way that the the game is called and it shrinks the playbook um so again I I know Brock Purdy's turnovers are up but he's throwing for yards he's throwing touchdowns and outside of I think one stinker game he has done a great job of holding this team together uh from a leadership standpoint standpoint not throwing anybody under the bus taking the accountability and willing to work with and trust and throw the ball to these guys that he hasn't had as much experience with isaac arendo is a rookie running back out of louisville fourth round pick 
had 85 yards in this game, 14 carries and a touchdown. Could have had another one. He slid to end the game, kind of iced I the game. I wish he would have just scored that one. I don't know what the the pain. I don't know why you don't just want to because you go up by two scores. It's like yeah, the game is extended a little bit, but you get two touchdowns. I don't know. It wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world if he scored a touchdown there. Um, it's it it felt like hey, we can plug anyone into this running back spot, whether it's Jordan Mason, McCaffrey, Garenda. Seems like anyone in this running back room is going to have success to some degree if you're running the football for the San Francisco 49ers. The same way it felt like last year with the Dolphins offense, like. No matter who they put in that spot, that guy's going to run for a ton of yards. Right. What would you make of watching Garendo succeed? I don't know that I really have an opinion on it, to be honest with you. The Other thing, than I'm it's gonna, cool? Like yeah, you're happy for him? It was cool. I'm happy for him. I thought he ran physical. I think there's a few plays that once he gets into the second level, um, a few more years of experience, he can maybe stretch those four or five yard runs into 10 and 12 with a few moves here and there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought he, like I said, I thought he did great. He was a more than serviceable running back. Um, he ran physical and he maintained that identity that those San Francisco running backs have. The Cowboys are three and four. They had the ball late and didn't get it done, in my opinion. I know that's a, a brutal evaluation. Yeah. But um, Dak had uh, another frustrating game, two interceptions. Um, and I just think it looks incredibly overpaid. It, it's frustrating. I know it's the same narrative every week with Dak Prescott, but Mike McCarthy's not getting it done. Dak's not getting it done. Dak now post injury doesn't look as mobile. I just think the Cowboys are in such a bind right now. And I, I don't know how to fix their problems other than like now they've paid Dak. So they're now locked in the same way, even like the Browns are with Deshaun Watson. So you have to figure it out with Dak Prescott. Dak's going to be your quarterback now for a couple of years. So the mm-hmm. only thing you can do is change head coaches. I, I'm just really like, like Austin is a, a huge Dallas Cowboys fan. He's never felt mm-hmm. more apathetic. He told me than watching this loss. He's like, I just, yeah, we, we expected this. It's frustrating. It's, it's boring. Do you have anything you want to add to the conversation about Dallas? I feel like I don't. It's the same conversation every week. Like Dak's overpaid. The coach is wrong. I can only say that until I'm blue in the face and then just kind of walk away. But anything you want to add to that conversation? Yeah, I actually. This is going to sound strange. I don't think that McCarthy is the problem this year. I don't think that he's the coach to get you over the edge um, sure. in, into those big playoff wins. But I don't think that this is a, a, a McCarthy problem. To me, this is a personnel problem uh, on both sides of the football. Because outside of Dak, CD, Micah, Lawrence, uh, you just there's not a lot out there to write home about. And I think that that mismatch in personnel, uh, Mike Zimmer kinds of runs an outdated defense. I thought he was going to be a little bit better in replacing Dan Quinn um, offensively with McCarthy calling the plays. There's nothing incredibly dynamic. Um, man, I guess maybe I don't have more to add, but I do think that the the personnel uh, top to bottom is more than issue is more of an issue than anything. They're one of the smallest teams in the NFL on both fronts, and that spells disaster when you can't run the football and when you can't stop the run. You're not going to win football games, and that's it's a it might be an oversimplified take, but that's that's really how it is, and that's what you see from the worst teams in the league. You get ran on, and you can't ran and you can't run on other people, and when you can't mm-hmm. set the tone at the line of scrimmage you're not going to win football games. And part of that is just the identity and that showing up that I'm going to dominate somebody. And it just doesn't feel like they have that this year. They don't have that. They don't have that dog mentality. Dak, you would, Dak is still going to have great games. CD is still going to have great games, but as a whole, they lack any sort of physical presence. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's going to be hard for them. Yeah. They're playing without Michael Parsons in this game. And it sounds like to me, you would say, Hey, my McCarthy is not great. He's not, this bad it's no. it's more a problem with hey jerry jones the guy building the team has made moves that have hamstrung this team and not been great for their future and that's that's what we're seeing now week to week with the dallas cowboys is jerry jones built a bad football team if there's if you're gonna pay guys why wait so long to pay them and i know that guys like cd they wanted top top of the market so they were holding out to make sure that they got the best but it, take care of this stuff years earlier 
right? Yeah. Before the discussions even become what they are. So you don't have guys going into contract years, uh, you know, not knowing what's coming up next. Like that is such a problem. It creates so much noise in the off season. And then you end up paying the maximum, not just top dollar in the league. Like you end up paying the maximum. And yeah. all this while you're not even looking or paying attention to other potential free agents or players on your own roster that you can develop and grow to help make your team better. And that to me is the the sin of Dallas. Honestly, paying players is very similar to buying a new car or buying HVAC equipment in that it's never going to be cheaper than it is right now. <laughs> the longer you wait, the more the price is going to go up. And that's just the unfortunate reality yeah. of inflation and the way things are working, but it's also the way it works in the football world. Um, I'm glad you said that. That actually reminds me, I got to get some airline tickets to go home for a Thanksgiving. Great reminder. I'll remind you when we finish too. Go <laughs> get, dude, it's clock is ticking now. It's October 28th. Yeah. Um, my drive. Hey, I, I think it's a pretty drive. I like it. It's I long, it. but it's pretty. Um, <laughs> Washington beat Chicago 18 to 15. This game was so, I was watching it live. I couldn't believe it. Um, it was a blast. In fact, actually, Molly left for work right after the Bears scored what I thought was a game-winning touchdown. Bears score a touchdown with 25 seconds left. She's like, has to leave for work. She waits a couple extra seconds because we're watching together. And she's like, I just want to see the Bears maybe win this football game. They win, quote-unquote. She leaves for work. And I text her like five minutes later, dude, guess what? The Bears lost. <laughs> and she's like, what? So yeah. let's talk about it, man. You know, there's a Hail Mary thrown by Jay and Daniels for the game winner. It was really, really cool to see. Um, I just thought this game delivered, first of all. It, the, number one against number two, Caleb Williams against Jaden Daniels. It was a fun matchup. It was dramatic. It was crazy. It was cool. Um, before we talk about more nuance, do you have anything you want to say about this game just generally from a high-level view? Yeah, I, I walked into this game expecting the Bears, honestly, to win by 7+. plus. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and here's why I felt that the commanders hadn't played a legitimate, very solid defense in a while. And I feel like their defense, while they are disciplined and strong under Dan Quinn, they don't have the personnel to hang with as much offensive firepower out as the Bears have. So I thought yeah. two things were going to happen. I, th I thought we were going to see a game where Jaden Daniels had two plus turnovers. And I thought Caleb Williams was going to have two plus touchdowns and they were really going to be able to move the ball offensively. Neither of those things happen, resulting in this weird kind of sluggish offensive performance from both teams. But then that really turned it on uh, there in the final minute to to score some points. Um, that that's just kind of the view in in the macro. But goodness gracious, like I was just praising Shane Waldron last week, and now I feel like he's just a a, a crime. He's a he's committing crimes against humanity for how he's operating this offense. Either that or Caleb Williams really wasn't seeing it. And I'm curious what you think about uh, more so Caleb's performance being 10 of 24 than anything. I I think it's really easy to point fingers at Caleb Williams and say, hey, it's Jaden Daniels a better player. And, and certainly Jaden Daniels is having a little better rookie year. I, I also think they're in different situations, like very, very different with different offensive coordinators and whatever you want to say. I think both rookie quarterbacks are are really on the right track. And I think you, like I see, I saw a lot of posts that, Hey, um, the bears drafted the wrong guy. I just don't feel that way. I think they got the guy that way for them. I actually think a lot of the rookie quarterbacks, like Bo Nix looks like a hit. Drake may looks like a success. There's a lot of, I look around the league and go, man, these rookie quarterbacks are in a really good spot. The NFL is in a good spot in general. Um, I, I really thought that he saved his performance by scoring the, what I thought was a game winning touchdown. Like if you, right. Don't have that touchdown at the end. The narrative is really, really bad today. You get a touchdown with 25 seconds left, and it feels like you won. I mean, they, for yeah, all intents and purposes, did. he did everything necessary to win. And I, I remember saying to Molly, like, finally the Bears have a quarterback that can get it done in a crucial moment at the end of a game. Now, unfortunately, that didn't lead to a victory. Right. But he did his part to win. So if they win this game uh, with Caleb Williams' final touchdown, twenty, you know, 12 to 15, no one today is asking the question about Caleb Williams, but instead the outcome goes the other way. And now we're pointing fingers at Caleb Williams. I think he did enough to win and his defense, let him down. Um, he's a rookie quarterback figuring it out. And I'm just never going to be in a hurry to throw a kid under the bus or talk about, it, especially when he's had some really good games so far during this rookie season, it's been up and down, but 
I think ultimately I feel great about Caleb Williams. And that's a long, maybe almost political non-answer, right? It's like a word salad, but um, I, I walk away still feeling pretty good about Caleb Williams right now if I'm a Bears fan. Yeah, I think so too. I don't think that he we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> Caleb is going to be an excellent player. I just want to know what maybe was off uh, on this offense. We saw maybe you could chalk it up to you know coming off a little bit maybe lax or not incredibly focused after the bye week, but something wasn't clicking offensively after you know three weeks. And we called this out. It wasn't great competition, but after three weeks of solid offensive production. Uh, my my kind of counter question might be is, is this Washington defense better than we thought? I'm looking back here. They allowed 15 to the Bears, 7 to Carolina, only 23 points given up to Baltimore, 13 to Cleveland, 14 to Arizona, 33 to Cincy, but Cincy, uh, whatever with Cincy right now. Um, 18 point. I know that's great analysis. Whatever was Cincy, uh, 18 to the Giants and only 20 to Tampa Bay. I'm sorry. They gave up 37 to Tampa Bay in the opener. Like, is this defense solid outside of those big games to Tampa Bay and Cincinnati? Like, they've kind of been holding teams, like some decent teams offensively, to some pretty low points. I think you got to feel great if you're a Washington Commanders fan. You're six and two. I think a defense is better than uh, maybe we we expect going into the year. I mean, this is maybe one of the better defenses Caleb Williams has played all year. I know that's kind of a weird controversial statement, but Dan Quinn is doing some really good stuff and and has really, uh, in my opinion, put them in a good position where every week he's getting great play calls out there. They're they're just the most competitive defense they've been in in years with Dan Quinn. Um, I I really would need to go back and, and, if I'm honest with myself, like comb through the film more clearly to give a good answer why Caleb Williams struggled with this defense specifically, but... Um, the truth is I've been compiling their film every week and just kind of building towards any of a, a big, really thoughtful analysis on each one. Um, and I, so I haven't watched, you know, every single throw of this game the way I really would like to. Um, but I, I just have a hard time coming down so hard on a quarterback um, this at this point. And then again, the defense, I think, in Washington has done much better than I think people realize uh, with the, their scheme and with um, mm-hmm. the position they're putting guys in, if that makes sense. And so Washington six and two, they're, they're the front runner right now in their division comfortably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think they're just way better than anyone's given them credit for, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, they've got Bobby Wagner, although a little bit older, he's probably a great veteran presence for them. Did the, Wagner and Quinn might've been together in Seattle for a little bit. I think so. They, no, they, definitely they, they, were. they definitely may have been. They were. No, and then definitely they've they got were. Uh, Cle- Cle- Cleland Farrell, the cat from uh, Clemson. Cleland who was, Farrell. Yeah, Cle- Cleland Farrell, who was borderline looking like a bust, but Dan Quinn has him playing really well. They've got Deron Payne, um, Quan Martin, Mike Sandstrill. Like they've, I guess, got more talent maybe than we're giving them credit for. And again, like this is what makes Dan Quinn so great and certainly what they miss in Dallas. Like these guys are all on the same page with how they're playing defense, physical, flying around, ball hawks. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm excited to see them continue to grow. Two games from now, they play Pittsburgh. And that's that's a really fascinating matchup, I think. A good defense against Russell Wilson, a good defense against Jan Daniels, two defensive-led football teams that are actually are very similar. I think Jaden Daniels is a more dynamic quarterback than Russell Wilson is like, that's, that's just a really interesting matchup that I'm honestly not sure who's going to win. Uh, they're both six and two right now. It's a huge game two weeks from now between Pittsburgh and Washington. Yeah. Uh, the way Jaden Daniels throws the deep ball is just, it, it's so impressive to me the way he's able to attack over the top and pick his spots. And I think that's what makes him so tough to defend is, is, is he's confident to let it rip. And that makes it so hard on a defense. Like there's a guy like Daniel Jones if I'm a safety, I might let my guy run past me. Daniel Jones ain't throwing that football. But Jaden Jaden Daniels has done a great job of recognizing those matchups and giving guys like Terry McLaurin the chance to catch big balls. Um, and then having the arm strength to get the ball to the end zone there at the end, I thought that was pretty impressive as well. He just looks good. Like We got to stop calling it this li- little college offense. Everybody are out here saying, oh, it's just, you know, they're just doing what he liked in college, blah, blah, blah. It, Deshaun Watson did that when he came from uh, from Clemson uh, and had Bill O'Brien in Houston. They were doing something very similar. Like, do what your quarterback likes and what he's comfortable with. 
and maybe you'll find some success within reason, right? But Jaden Daniels, obviously very special. Well, the other thing, I mean, they ran the ball a lot. So they, they had 18 carries and 129 yards and a touchdown with DeAndre Swift. Um, they ran the ball 34 times. Some of those are Caleb Williams taking off and making and plays happen. That. And I love but, the way they're running the rock. Well, again, 10 of those carries are, are, are Caleb Williams running. True. Um, for his but life. Jaden Daniels had more yards, like 21 for 38 passing, 326 yards, only one touchdown. They weren't finishing drives. And that's been a pretty consistent theme in Washington. And, um, they had a game where they had seven field goals. Like they're not perfect, I guess, week to week. Mm-hmm. They're, they're getting points. Um, and other than a Hail Mary, that stat line would be really different from Jaden Daniels too. Yeah. So I just, I don't think that everyone's saying Jaden Daniels is way better than Caleb Williams. Maybe if you're like counting numbers and stats to me, watching the game didn't feel like Jaden Daniels was light years ahead of Caleb Williams from a a development standpoint. He just had one great play at the end that makes, you know, the difference more memorable. But yeah, um, I I didn't feel like Jaden Daniels is way better than Caleb Williams, in my opinion, just watching it. I don't think so either. He would have been what probably 270 yards, one touchdown on 21 of 38 or 20 of 38. Wow. 20 of 37 completions. Like, wouldn't have been a, a superb game. But again, that one throw that he did make, the deep ball over the top to Terry McLaurin, like, changes the game. So it had more than 100 yards more. I mean, it's not nothing, but. 10 for 24 is not good, no matter how you slice it. Only, there might have only been one guy worse than him, and that's your boy, Anthony Richardson. I'm waiting. <laughs> I, you know, I'm trying to be patient with Anthony Richardson. It's, uh, it's getting. Well, what's more frustrating is watching him in a, in a key moment, like come out of the game. Like Anthony Richardson is a player that I'm really trying to defend and trying to be patient with and waiting and waiting. And it's, he's really talented. And if he ever figures that out, he's a huge dangerous player. But so far, I'm still waiting to see. But I just, I, I think, you know, after two years of Josh Allen, you could have criticized him pretty heavily too. So I'm just trying to take my time. Very true. Very let true. it develop, let it come along. I think they're similar players from a talent perspective. Can we shift gears to another New York team? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess so. The uh, the unthinkable happened. The Jets lost again. And they didn't just lose. They lost to the Patriots. The Patriots beat in the Jets 25. Fashion, in historic fashion. Why, why was it historic? Tell me why. Um, I think it was the first team to have, it was like an X amount of yards of offense with zero turnovers and a lead at this point and whatever like there were all teams were 756 and 0 until yeah. the jets i gotta find exactly what it was but it was again truly historic fashion the patriots beat the jets 25 to 22 and actually like you're right it, it this wasn't aaron Rodgers' fault the offense played pretty well um I, I think it's hard to point a finger at him when they 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 score at the end of the fourth quarter they're trying to make plays they're trying to keep themselves alive they're doing good stuff um Honestly, this loss feels like, hey, the Jets' defense hasn't been the same since firing Robert Sala. And and the truth is, we've talked about it before, I think you actually put too much on the plate of Jeff Ulbrich. He's trying to be head coach and call the plays on the defense and do everything. And I just think he's overextended personally. Um, but I, I find it really funny. The more the Jets lose, I don't have n- nothing productive to add to this conversation. I yeah. just personally enjoy watching the Jets lose. And I find it really interesting that week to week, they're... They're actually doing well on offense now that things have shifted. Are they? And they're still of, losing. That that first touchdown drive that they had, um, if it was not for two, one was okay, but two pass interference calls like that drive is dead. Like the, the, pen, the penalties moved them down the field. And uh, yeah, they ended up scoring later in the third quarter. But uh, I mean, you got blanked in the second quarter and then. Um, you know, you're trying to put things yeah. together in the fourth quarter, but I, I don't I don't think this offense did anything uh, amazing. No, but the truth is Aaron Rodgers had a touchdown with like two minutes left. So they give their defense a lead and all they got to do is stop their defense. That's the t- that's the one thing about the Jets in the last couple of years that you hang your hat on. Our defense gets it done. Mm-hmm. And, and frankly, Aaron did enough to win this game. I, I look, I'm really hard on Aaron. I criticize him and he deserves it. Is the offense incredible? No, but they give themselves a 22 to 17 lead with how much time left on the clock? Two minutes, three minutes, and gosh, um, more than that. 
The Jets score a touchdown with, why can't I find it? Two minutes and 57 seconds left in the game. So you give your defense a lead and the defense blows the game, in my opinion. Like that's that's the rough way to look at it is Aaron Rodgers did enough to win. The one thing the Jets are known for is their defense and the defense didn't get it done here. I think, again, I just it's hard for me to not look at it that way that he did enough to win. That's fair, but I'm not paying Aaron Rodgers and his entire crew that he bought he brought from Green Bay <laughs> to do enough to win. Sure. I'm paying you to win the game. We got you, Devontae Adams. We've got Garrett Wilson for you already. We've got Brees Hall. We've got Braylon. We've got plenty of weapons. We've got Alan Lazard. You need to score more points, especially against this Patriots defense that, sure, it's Patriots defense and they're good. It's old Belichick. No. This is one of the worst football teams in the league that lost their starter mid-game. You need to win that football game, period. End of story. There's no, oh, Aaron Rodgers did enough to win. No. You Mm. need to win. I'm paying you to win. I brought in Devonta Adams for you to win. Not to do enough to win, yeah, but to, but to do it. No, I guess there's a world where they score 40 on the, the Patriots and win easily, and there's no conversation here. I just, yeah, I, I'm getting tired of coming after Aaron constantly when it's like, well, like, I, I guess I, I'm trying to be fair here, and maybe I'm overthinking it, but it's like, well, look, Aaron put him in a position to win the game, and this time the defense let him down. Jacksonville scored 30 plus, Houston scored 40 plus. Yeah. Yeah, against against the Patriots, I mean. The against Stevens. the Patriots, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear I hear what you're saying. We to to pile on to Aaron would be part of the the larger media narrative of what's being constructed in New York, right? But at at the end of the day, right? Like if you're getting paid well and we got you all your nice toys, then I need you to I need you to win these kind of games because these were the kind of games, albeit a little bit lower scoring that we were begging to have Aaron come in and win. Like, oh, if our offense could have just done a little more, our defense did, you know, okay enough. If we just had a little more offense, then let's see a little bit more offense. Come on now. I got two write-ins from Patreon about this topic. Tim writes in and says, I want to be excited about the Patriots beating the Jets this week, but I think this game was a lot more about New York than about New England. They're 0-3 since they fired Robert Sala. They were the favorites in two of those games and are now in last place in the AFC East. I will never believe that poverty franchise will turn it around before they prove it to me. All they've ever shown is that they're a poorly run organization from top to bottom. I thought an old quarterback joining a super team is supposed to be an automatic Super Bowl. Rodgers has always been a whiny little bleep who blames anyone but himself for his team's (laughs) failures. I can't wait to hear what his excuse is for this week. I just hope Drake, Drake May is okay. He looked great before the helmet to helmet hit. He did. So that's a that's a pretty anti Aaron Rodgers, but it's also again anti Jets. They just I've seen so many iterations of this Jets team. They draft Sam Darnold. They're supposed to win. Oh, okay, that that was just the quarter. Adam Sam Gates Darnold was bad. Le'Veon Bell. Yeah. No. We now we got Zach Wilson. We're, we're, new quarterback. It'll be better this time, and that blows up. And now you get Aaron Rodgers, and this is going to work, and that fails too. At some point, you have to acknowledge that the the organization, at, from a organizational standpoint, they're a failure as well as yeah, the, the product on the field. It's also behind the scenes. This organization really struggling as well. Yeah, absolutely. Again, Troy it, writes in a lot of missed field goals. Troy says, and you, if you back up, I think it'll focus on you. <laughs> oh, oh, there. Am I, oh, am wow. I getting the? Wow, I know it's weird. Like your your autofocus loves you sometimes. Troy says hello to Zach's eyeballs. With the recent loss uh, streak of the Jets basically putting the nail in the coffin for them this year. Bang, bang. What now? Do you see Aaron Rodgers retiring after this year? Do they lose enough to have a high draft pick and reset at quarterback? Where do you think the Jets offseason goes from here? Here's the problem, Nathan. I don't think you can draft a quarterback number one overall and... and I'm not going to have any confidence they're going to figure it out. I saw them do it with Sam Darnold. I saw them do it with Zach Wilson. Like they're going to ruin whatever guy they draft. I I actually don't have any ideas where you go from here because I just think the organization's a a, a huge mismanaged mess. Yeah, it's all going to be dependent on who ends up being the head coach there and what they can do to stave off Woody Johnson. That's kind of been the story 
Um, he, you know, he pushed for the drafting of Sam Darnold. He pushed for the uh, acquisition of Le'Veon Bell. It, just all these little things throughout the history of the Jets um, have resulted in less than desirable products on the field, right? I'm not sure where you where you do go from here if you're them, but I, I know that Aaron Rodgers isn't going to retire. He's far too prideful for this to be the way that he goes out. Um, he's going to need a <laughs> playoff appearance before he decides to retire or some sort of injury that really puts him out. Well, I also think Aaron does, this is weird to say, but probably gives them their most stable option at quarterback for next year. I just Absolutely. Even if you have a first-round pick and you, you draft a guy at, at the top, um, that kid's not going to be ready, and the situation around him isn't going to be good or conducive to a quarterback succeeding. Um, I think Aaron's, uh, unless the Jets get rid of him, Aaron's the guy next year. They're, the Jets are missing an offensive. They're miss, They're honestly missing a Matt LaFleur type guy, a guy who can work with Aaron but also encourage Aaron to see the offense his way. We saw in those first two years in Green Bay, things went really, really well. And then third year, not as great. Fourth year, wheels really started to fall off in that relationship that they had. You just need you need an offensive coordinator who's willing to have a voice and look Aaron in the eye and be like, no, this is how we need to run it. This is a modern NFL offense. This is going to set you up for s- some more success, but you need to make it sound like Aaron's idea. That's one of the the great yeah. skills that they talk about in negotiation and coaching. Like sometimes you got to make it sound like it's their idea, and you need somebody in there who's crafty enough to kind of play that game with Aaron to make him feel like he's created this new wizardry of offense. That might be like a little tinfoil hat type deal, but you just you need the right person to pair with Aaron, and it can't be somebody who's unwilling to speak up about how the offense should be run. What well, coach? We spent Casey, so much time on this for. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we have much to add, <laughs> and here we are, just bow, bow, well, bow. You know, Coach Dan Casey talked about Bill Walsh recently. How Bill Walsh, his theory was like, you got to sell the plan. You can't just make a great plan. You got to sell your players on your idea. Correct. You got to find a coach who can sell and, and pitch his plan to Aaron Rodgers, make Aaron Rodgers buy into it. I, honestly, I don't know that any coach is going to have a good or easy time working with Aaron. Now, I looked at Aaron's contract. He's under contract next year, so in 2025, and then it's over. Next year's the last year of Aaron Rodgers and the Jets. I'm really confident in that. I think he gets one more year. Basically, regardless, I, I just don't think he's going to do enough to save this and make them want to invite him back for 2026. Um, but I also think they're kind of hamstrung where no matter what they do, they've got him under contract. Even if you're in a business to draft a quarterback, sure you draft a guy in the first round, but Aaron's probably your guy week one next year. And I, I'm just not sure any coach is going to be good enough to make Aaron happy. He just seems like a guy who's miserable to work with. I, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to talk so badly about him. But I, just, I just can't imagine in, you know, having a good time coaching Aaron or yeah. working with him. Looking, looking at the future for the jets here, they've got next matchup is against Houston on Halloween. That might be a tough game for them. I, yeah. I don't think Houston has played superb this year, and now it looks like they've just lost Stefan Diggs potentially to a knee injury. So now you're missing Stefan sure. Diggs, and you're missing Nico Collins. Uh, if you're Houston, Jets maybe have a chance to win this game, you know, kind of on the short week. Follow that up with you've got Arizona, Indianapolis, and Seattle. All to me, winnable games. Yeah. You have to win three out of those four games. That's how I see it. Obviously, you want to win against Houston so this losing streak doesn't keep going on, but you can't lose to Arizona. You definitely can't lose to Indy. In Seattle, like we've talked about, they're an inconsistent team. You're not sure which Seattle is going to show up, but you need to win three of those four games. Otherwise, it's going to be... I don't even know. It's already a disaster, but it, it might get even nastier. A nasty disaster. Well, when the Jets were two and four, they they just lost to Buffalo. We said on this show, hey, they're going to lose probably in two of their next three. We thought it was going to be Pittsburgh and Houston. <laughs> I did not expect them to lose to the Patriots. I just didn't ah. envision that. They've got a chance to still, you know, maybe beat Houston and make that two or three true, but it's possible they lose three of the next three from that Buffalo Bills point. Um and, and I don't, I'm not confident, like, sure, they're winnable games after Houston, but Arizona's no slouch. They played, you know, they played Buffalo pretty tough. They got Kyler Murray, who gets hot at times. The Colts, I'm less confident in Seattle's, has their moments. Um, although Seattle's got to fly a long way to make that game happen over in New York. They do. 
the Dolphins have two a back. I, I think the Dolphins probably beat the Jets. Like, I don't know, man. It's nothing's guaranteed in this league. And I, I'm really not confident in the Jets' ability to win football games at this point. It's it seems like it's always something with them. And it's frankly different things week to week. It's like I I just I don't know. Yep. How about Denver, man? They're five and three. Um, I really I'm enjoying watching the Denver Broncos make progress as a franchise. I think it's working under Sean Payton. Bo Nix is coming along. Bo Nix against uh, Carolina this past weekend, 28 for 37, 284 yards, four total touchdowns. He ran for one. He threw for three, had zero turnovers on the day. Um, Denver beat Carolina 24 to 14. I really like what I'm seeing from the Denver Broncos. Do you kind of agree? I think I've really got confidence they're doing right by Bo Nix and, and developing as a franchise and, it's slowly but surely working uh, under Sean Payton. Yeah, it is slowly but surely working, and I think that's what we expected. Number one, when you have a rookie quarterback, not everybody can be Jaden Daniels. But since they lost those first two games, uh, first one to Seattle, you're not quite sure. Pittsburgh, that's a really tough draw for yeah. your second game in the NFL. But you've gone five and one in your last six. Bonix has 11 total touchdowns, only one interception, uh, and he looks settled in. Like one of the things we talked about with Bonix early was his feet didn't look settled and it was causing him to miss throws. He's starting to display that accuracy that we saw at the 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 most prestigious university in the world, the University of Oregon. That that elite accuracy and ball placement that he had, getting it out on time, getting it out on location. And it's yeah, it's it's starting to show. Now, granted. Uh, it was the Jets, the Raiders, New Orleans, and Carolina that they beat. But the important thing is, is they are winning the games despite the talent, and they're winning in some level of convincing fashion. So that's what's been great to see. Um, I think also their defense, their decent, their defense has looked spectacular. Uh, we talked about um, a few defenses that haven't had the personnel this year. Uh, we look at the Commanders, we look at Dallas, and we look at um, the team with Denver lacking in the personnel top to bottom. But you see the difference in two teams that are very well coached defensively and the difference that that makes in their, not just how they play, you know, from the, from the start, but how they continue to grow and get better. Um, So hopefully they can take this momentum. They can keep going. I love seeing Troy Franklin get in the mix. They're starting to figure out how to utilize him in the offense, Cortland Sutton and Bo Nix outside of the week previous where Cortland had no targets and no catches. They're starting to have a great rapport. Things are truly trending up for them. They've got a great test these next couple of weeks. They've got Baltimore. They've got Kansas City. And we're going to see what kind of metal these guys really have. Yeah, they shouldn't be a favorite to win. They're playing at Baltimore than at Kansas City, followed Ooh, up by playing Atlanta. Who's? I mean, so they're hard. playing three playoff teams back to back to back. However, I will say... Um, it's it's a non-zero chance they win this game. Like they 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 could beat Baltimore. They could beat Kansas City. I don't think they're going to. I think I feel more confident they beat Kansas City than going to Baltimore and winning. Oh no! I, I think I think there's a shot. No, I, I don't. I think look, you know, they play Kansas City two more, you know, two times this year. Yeah, end of the year and now, there's a shot they win one of those two games against Kansas City. I, I know that's weird to say, but I don't um, think there's any shot for that one. But look at Kansas City's schedule, right? Of the teams that have a shot to beat them, I, I look. It's either Buffalo or Houston, the Steelers. But I think playing Denver twice. Denver's proven to be a pretty competent football team. There's there's a non-zero chance Denver because look the way Kansas oh, we, City we, loses. Well, well, here's the deal. We talked about it. It's the the final week of the season, right? Yeah, they've already got you know everything locked up. They're going to be playing against. But if they're Carson sixteen, no, they're, they're going to try to win. Like they do, and, they, and and so then the Broncos definitely aren't winning that game if they're trying yeah. all out. But my, I, I, I think what's I think the way Kansas City is going to lose this year, their first game is going to be a weird game you don't expect. It's not going to be an obvious Bills team or a, a playoff team. They're going to lose to a team that you're like, what? And it's a team that plays played them. Sean Payton's played them already before. It's a team that they've got really a lot of familiarity with. That's the kind of team that beats. It's a division game against Denver. That's how Kansas City is going to lose their first game. It's something like that. Something weird you don't expect rather than the obvious juggernaut game you really get up for. Um, anyway, I just my point is I feel really good about Denver. And I, I don't think they're going to beat Baltimore or Kansas City. But it feels possible. And last year that didn't even feel possible. 
Yeah, you're right. And I, I still think that this team is just a year away from being very, very good. A year away, uh, maybe one more draft class, uh, kind of feeling like, a different version of the Lions from a couple of years ago. There's still a lot of personnel to get. But again, like you stack a couple of draft classes together and it's helmed by the acquisition of a quarterback, things could start to look really, really good. You sure up that offensive line. Uh, and this is the one knock I have on them. They haven't ran the ball incredibly and inf- effectively throughout the year. Yeah. Um, against uh, New Orleans, I think Javante kind of had his breakout game running the football. But again, that's a very depleted New Orleans team. But then again, Sean Payton doesn't really care to run the football. He uses the the screen the screen the screens the he screen game the, the, the screen, screen game. game. He uses those as <laughs> the extension of the run game, if you will. But yeah. I would like to see them maybe take a little bit more pressure off of Bo, not wear out his arm in the first two years and run the football. I will say there was a really irritating narrative in this football game. Uh, Denver was up twenty eight to seven in the fourth quarter. And Carolina got really mad at Denver and accused them of running up the score. And I'm like, guys, they're not up. They're not up 52 to seven. They're up 28 to seven. And, and frankly, a lead like that is still not safe in the NFL. They were mm. mad they went for a fourth down. They were mad, you know. They they threw for it in, in, in certain situations. And it's like, man, it's it's ridiculous at any any score to complain about a team running up the clock, or running up the score when it's like, look, you line up on the other side of the field. If you don't like it, stop them. But especially, I heard Sean Payton talk about this. Like, I've lost games that are up twenty-eight to seven in the fourth quarter. Like, that's yeah. not a safe lead. And I agree with him, by the way. A three-touchdown lead is nowhere near safe in the NFL. It's crazy. Carolina is complaining about that. It really shows the the headspace of Carolina. They they think the game is over. Right. Um, and they've I, already I, decided the game's over. They're just trying to go home. Yeah, I I really hate that complaint from anyone in Carolina that Sean Payton's running up the score on on, on the Carolina Panthers. Like, what kind of losers do you have to be to feel like a twenty eight to seven game is such a big insurmountable lead that the game is over early in the fourth quarter? Like, what are we doing? It's the NFL. I, Sean yeah. Payton's response was perfect. It's like if you don't like it, stop it. But I, I also I always a hundred percent of the time hate any complaint about the team running up the score unless it's pee wee football and you're winning by fifty shut the hell up and stop the team from scoring. It's very easy. If someone's talking crap, you stop them. If someone's doing something you don't like, it's a great opportunity to hit them in the mouth. That's what the rare thing about football is. You can hit people. And I just really, I saw that and I really, really hated it from Carolina. I I see this kind of two ways, right? If you're a two or a three, and this is finally your opportunity, I'm not taking it easy. I know that this film is going to get broken down by the coaches. Mm -hmm. I have to put good plays on tape, not just for, the coaches in this room, but the opportunity to become a trade piece or to be picked up in free agency if I get waived, because that's the inevitability of being a two or three or fourth player on the roster. There's an opportunity that you are moved at any instant. Uh, you're cut at any instant. You have to put good plays on tape for the sake of your NFL career. That's the first thing. The second thing, and this is more on the side of don't run up the score, there is a unspoken responsibility that both teams have when the game is out of reach to say, hey, let's get everybody home healthy. I don't think the game was at that point in this situation. And I don't agree, like you were saying, with with the mentality. You can't have the mentality, and and I would never vocalize vocalize it either, that I'm letting somebody blow me out and I'm telling them that they're... I'm never admitting that. I'm John the entire time. I'm like, hey, we coming. We're coming. Hey, one play. All we need is one play. You know, I'm not saying, bro... Stop running it up on us. So I can, I see what, you know, J, I believe it was JC Horn is saying the game wasn't at that point where it's time to respectfully get everybody home. Um, yeah. And, and Sean Payton's been ran up on last year. The Dolphins dropped 70. He knows what running up the score is. That, that's and truly that, running that's up the not, score. Yes. That is now, running up the score. Also, the plays that are in question, the things they were mad about. It's a fake field goal. It's a trick play on fourth down, like and different, different a fake field goal, but also later a trick play on fourth down. Those are very strategic, specific plays you want to run. A, you want to practice them, but B, you want to put them on film so teams preparing for you have something to think about. Right. Every time we do a motion, maybe they can throw the ball with Cortland Sutton, or every time there's a field goal, maybe they're going to run a fake field goal. Now you've got doubt if you're the opposing team playing Denver. You didn't have before. You've seen this play on film. That there's a reason for running that. 
it's not just Denver's yeah. trying to run up the score on you. It's no, we're strategically putting us on film so teams have to think about it when they play us. Like Absolutely. it's so much deeper than Carolina's acting. And I just it really I'm not a Broncos fan. I'm, I'm not really I like Sean Payton enough, but I'm not a, hit, a fan of his either, really necessarily. But I, I like him, and certainly there is a lot of thought behind these moves. It's not just thoughtfully, like, thoughtlessly like we're trying to crush you and embarrass you. Yeah. I mean, anyway, Slice said it's the NFL. You got to show up and put your big boy pants on every day, and you got to play every play of every day that you're out there. You like that? <laughs> I like the word salad. You like that? Uh, Detroit beat Tennessee 52 to 14 this past weekend. The Lions are 6 and 1. And the way they're doing it, you know, Jared Goff, 12 for 15, only 85 yards, three touchdown passes. Jameer Gibbs, 11 carries, 127 yards and a touchdown. Titans had four turnovers on the day. It's a, the way that the Lions beat people is up front, physically dominating people in the trenches. It's really interesting to see. Physically, Um, emotionally, psychologically. It's, it's nasty. They got to be the Super Bowl favorite, right? Right? Question mark. Oh, otherwise noted, the Kansas City Chiefs are the Super Bowl favorite. Period. Okay. But what, out of the what, NFC. Where, yeah, out of the NFC, there's no doubt right now. Uh, the last two performances they've had uh, have really solidified them as the top tier. But here's the deal: they only had 225 yards of offense, and they scored 52 points. Granted, like you said, <laughs> Titans are turning over the football deep in their territory, Getting making it really field. right, making it real like a really short field, making it super easy for the Lions to score. Um, for a second there, though, it looked like this was going to be a game, right? DeAndre Hopkins exits. You got Mason Rudolph playing. Calvin Ridley was hot to start the game. You're like, okay, like did the Titans kind of find something here, and then it fell off the rails in every way, shape, and form. They've got 25 touchdowns and 20 incompletions in their last five games, which is absurd. We here's my here's my deal. We are watching the 2007 Spurs right now. Mm. Like this team has played together for a number of years now. We have superstars on this team, but they're selfless. Uh, they're talented. They're polished. They're great physically. They're great emotionally. They have the battle scars. Like this is just truly a complete team. And the defense has responded to the the number of injuries and the multitude of injuries that they've had this year. Again, was it the Titans? Yes, but you took the ball away, and you didn't let the game get close. You stomped them out. You put them away. Um, if I also- could say. Yeah, when you play ahead. a bad team, you're supposed to crush them. Like yes. they did exactly what you're supposed to do when you play a team like Tennessee. And here's what I need to see. I need to see them go for broke. I need to see them make an aggressive trade for a pass rusher, which I know that people are saying maybe don't do. And I want to see them get another wide receiver weapon. I know that they are more than capable right now with the guys that they have on the roster to make things happen. But you have got to go for broke right now. Like these draft picks aren't going to mean anything when you're making these deep playoff runs. Not mean anything anything but your first round picks like late first round and to mid second round you're kind of looking at a lot of the same talent and brad holmes has proven it to be a guy that can find talent in the late second third fourth round think about starters they have right now kirby joseph malcolm rodriguez amon ross st brown um james houston um who else like you could go on like they've they've got a general manager who can find the talent like go out and go get a name right now. Go for broke. Like this is your year. The AFC is weaker than it has been in previous years. Yes, the NFC is stronger, but this is the strongest you have been. Put the icing on the cake. Here's my question. I, I think Max Crosby is worth whatever the Raiders want for him. I-, I don't know that he's on the trade block, but you can also make him available by giving up a player and and I'd give up two first round picks to get Max Crosby. I don't care about my, if you win the Super Bowl, you're picking at 32. Who cares about that pick? Like you said, um, Max Crosby for two firsts. Is that insane? Do the Raiders even go for that? What do you make of that idea? I, again, I, I'm with you. I would pay whatever it takes to go get a good pass rusher. Cause this, this is now, this is your spot to go win a Super Bowl. You got to maximize your window and go do whatever it takes to make that happen. Um, what do you make of that Max Crosby idea? I don't hate it, Um, and this is important that if they are going to pursue somebody like Max Crosby, it has to be somebody who's great for the locker room. You've got a great thing going right now. Whatever you're stirring in the pot, it is the perfect 
viscosity. It's the perfect texture. And you've got to keep that. If you bring in the wrong guy, all of a sudden he wants targets, he wants touches, or he wants to play on this part of the defensive scheme, or he starts playing a little bit too much eye guy football, you can kind of mess up what you got going. But I do think that Max Crosby um, is a guy to go after. I think uh, maybe a guy like Miles Garrett, I think that maybe with Jameis Winston coming back, they're going to be less apt to do mm-hmm. so. Um, Micah Parsons might be a guy who comes available. Um, I know that the Chargers, you know, prior to uh, Jim Harbaugh, were trying to move off of Khalil Mack. I know he's a little bit older, but he could be a guy who's great on your front side. Um, Jacksonville Jaguars, if they continue to lose games, you could look at a guy like Josh Hines Allen. That could be an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, again, it's got to it's got to be the right guy. Miles Garrett, maybe you pitch it that, hey, we're solving the Browns problem with Deshaun Watson. We'll, we'll make your books a little lighter. Max Crosby's contract, though, with the Raiders isn't crazy. You've got a potential out uh, leading into 2025 where you'd only pay $10 million of dead cap. He's only a $28 million salary cap hit next year in 2025, 24 of the year after that. He's got two years left after this season. For for what Max Crosby brings to the table, like is that an expensive amount of money? Yeah, like that's a big contract, but... It's not insane to pay a guy like Max what he's on the books for. I I, I look, I, I don't care what it takes. If I'm the Lions, I'm doing anything humanly possible to get that guy. Went to Eastern Michigan, get him in your building because you, you have a need at the pass rusher position. He solves that problem. But also think about if you can retain him, Aiden, you know, Hutch playing with Max Crosby in the future is insane. I, I mean, that, that possibility <laughs> would be Maybe not, we're not just talking about one Super Bowl this year. Maybe we're talking about the one after that too. I mean, for real, like that, those two paired together would be so much fun to watch. Um, I'm begging for that. I, I think Detroit, all of Michigan's begging for that move to happen. And it's a no brainer to pay whatever the, whatever the asking price is. Cause again, if it's two first and a second, two first, a second, a third, I don't care. I know that's a lot, but like how much are those later draft picks really bringing, mm. especially with the context of you might never get a chance to win a Super Bowl again. You got to win the Super Bowl. You got to yeah. throw every egg you can in this basket right now and mortgage your future, kind of like the Rams did a couple of years ago with your former quarterback, Matthew Stafford, actually. Right. So the future doesn't matter when you've got a shot to win a Super Bowl right now, this year. Yeah. Win it now. Just be careful. Also, Ben Johnson's leaving. So your window might close anyway. And you don't have, you're not guaranteed anything after this year. I really would true. just do whatever you can. At least we assume the offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson's leaving after this year. You can't assume I mean, you're going to have a shot to win a Super Bowl after this season. I mean, if I'm Ben Johnson and they pay me a head coach's salary, why would I leave? I mean, I know why I would leave, right? The personal ambition of going out and sure, proving sure. that you can be an NFL head coach. But, you know, if you're, if you're a nicely overpaid coordinator, you get to stay in Detroit and coach what is this, you know, beautiful wonderland of talent. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let, let's end with this. Oh. I don't want to talk about this really, but I want to give a shout out to Tampa Bay. They lost to Atlanta this weekend. Um, they 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 were they made it much closer of a game than I expected. I just a little tip of the cap, you know, without their top two receivers, I thought that game was going to be a blowout. I did and, too. Uh, you know, Atlanta lose. Atlanta beats Tampa thirty-one to twenty-six. Baker two interceptions, but three touchdowns made it a game, made it interesting. I just respect that performance. I didn't expect that from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Is that um, the uh, is that the division sweep for the Falcons? Oh man! So they beat uh, New Orleans, it, it Tampa, did. Carolina, did. Tampa yeah, again. I went on Tampa. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. That's wild. Both good, good close games too. I mean, you can only you can only imagine what would have happened if Mike Evans had been healthy and Chris yeah. Godwin wasn't out for the year. It's like ah, oh, like I, I think Tampa gets them there. Honestly, I think so too. And, and shout and out to Baker. You know, he, he played really well. Shout out to Baker. Unshout out to the Falcons defense. I know that the Buccaneers offense is, is proven to be really <laughs> solid with Baker at the helm, but yeah. man, like this Falcons defense is uh not as advertised. No, I, I thought they were maybe a Super Bowl favorite and they they're not at all. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's really clear after Detroit, there's not much to contend in, in the NFC. In fact, honestly, the only people left to really contend for Super Bowl in the NFC is the rest of the NFC North, in my opinion. Is <laughs> their own division. Yeah. Yeah. And then what'd you make of, we don't have to, I don't know if yet we didn't talk about preparing for this, but uh, I'm curious what you make of Philly beating Cincinnati 37 to 17 and frankly doing it very similar to the way the lions actually win with, you know, not a lot of passing 
Uh, you know, 16 for 14 for or 16 for 20 for Jalen Hurts, 236 yards and a touchdown. Yeah. Very similar to a Jared Goff level performance. They're running the ball a ton. Jalen ran for three touchdowns. Kind of a grind it out, win the game up front. Um, what did you make of Philly beating Cincinnati? And, and Philly's now five and two. They're, you know, Washington six and two. Philly's five and two. That division has no. really come down to Washington or Philly. And it's really a compelling, interesting battle between those two teams. What did you make of that game? This is the first time we saw an established identity of Philadelphia. They looked physical and things looked easier for Jalen Hurts. So I'm not sure if Kellen Moore maybe simplified some things or they said, hey, like we're out thinking the room here. Let's hand the rock to Saquon. Uh, let's get the ball to our pass catchers and let's play some good football, right? Like I don't know if it really was that simple if they just got together and said, hey, we need to be more physical up front to set the stage for our back end. But to me, it, that's what looked like happened. Um, I think that the Bengals tremendously, tremendously missed T Higgins, which to me is concerning for that offense. Yeah. You still got Jamar Chase. You've got Jermaine Bur- Burton. You've got Yoshivas. You've got other talent on that team. And I'm curious why without T Higgins, th- really this year, the games that he's missed, the offense really has not been incredibly for du- productive. So that's concerning. But again, back to Philly. We saw physicality from this team. Uh, We saw the defense step up and make a number of big plays. And then, yeah, offensively, Jalen just looked the most comfortable that he has all year uh, throwing the football. And he looked confident in his decisions to take off uh, with the football in his hands. It didn't look like he was trying to stick in too long and make the pass. He just he looked decisive. And to me, that is incredibly important. You know, they lost to Atlanta. Philly did with a crazy comeback from Kirk Cousins, a drive to make it happen in the end. They lose to Tampa, who I think, honestly, injuries aside, Tampa's proven to be a pretty quality team before everyone got hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, they're 5-2. and two. I, I I wonder if some of what went on with Philly is, look, they've got new coordinators. They're you know, on both sides of the ball. It took a little bit of time. But now they've got an opportunity where the next couple games, they'll play Jacksonville and Dallas. They've got a shot to win those two games and get rolling before they play Washington, the Rams and Baltimore. Um, maybe we, did we write off Philly a little too quick? It seems like they might, they might swing back around and um, give themselves a shot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't think we wrote them off. I think that we were just expressing the concerns with how bad things looked. Yeah. There's adjusting to new coordinators and new personnel. And then there's looking like you don't know how to play and or coach football. And I feel like that's what we were seeing. Like we were seeing a team that just looked like they had no clue what was going on when they went out there. When they went out there and flip that to what we've seen from them the past two weeks against the Giants, against Cincinnati coming out of the bye, they look confident and sure in themselves. Um, so I do, I do think it, that was the case. Everybody needed to get on the same page. But I think it was shocking how... Um, how stark that different, how stark that difference was. I'd like to see a world where Philly can emerge as a Super Bowl contender. Honestly, um, I, I think that they've got the pieces on paper to do that. Vic Fangio on the defensive coordinator, Kellen Moore on the offense side of the football, Jalen Hurts, Saquon Barkley, AJ Brown, um, the Devontae Smith. Like Devontae they got Smith. players who can make a lot of stuff happen. Uh, I just like to see it all come together. There's still time for that to happen. There's time, in my opinion, for Philly to develop into a Super Bowl contender and maybe challenge a team like yeah. Detroit. And frankly, I'm rooting for. I think it's good for football if they get better and it can. If they play Baltimore really strong on December first, and you know if they maybe win their division and, and can challenge a team like Dallas, they've got the firepower to do that. And, and I hope Dallas. that is what happens. Yeah, they can certainly beat Dallas. I think. I'm sorry, that, I meant I meant Detroit. Excuse me, the other D team. Ah, gotcha. Uh, I think on I don't paper think they you. could by the end of the year, come to a position where maybe they could challenge a Detroit. I'm not sure they will, but yeah. on paper, they've certainly got the Jimmy's and Joe's to do that. I think it's <laughs> the Jimmy's and Joe's. I think <laughs> it'll, it to me, it'll depend on the health of the, uh, the Lions defense. That'll be a, a big indicator there. Um, I, I don't think Philly's defense is spectacular, although, although they've played better the past couple weeks. And here's my deal. You're playing against some weak defenses here. You've got the giants, you've got Cincinnati, you've got Jacksonville and you've got Dallas coming up. You need to get that positive momentum going. You need to reinforce um, those good feels, right, uh, on the offensive side of the football. Uh, whatever's working, um, you know, I can't point a finger on what you know changed uh, other than things looked simpler. Yeah, but whatever's working, keep doing it and just keep leaning into it and stack those wins and stack that momentum. You want to look ahead to week nine? 
Yeah, let's look at week nine. So Thursday night football, Houston plays the Jets. You got a six and two Houston team playing on the road at a two and six Jets team. But Houston's all banged up at receiver. Maybe that gives the Jets an edge a little bit. Yeah. You got the Bills Dolphins rematch. Uh Tua played, he came back and played this week. They lost by one to Arizona. It's Tua playing the team that injured him. <laughs> I uh I, I don't feel great about that game at all. That's uh that's a I don't know. Stay healthy, Tua. I said this earlier this year when I talked about Mike McDaniel as a great play caller. I'm sorry, not as a great play designer, but not a great play caller. This offense to me has not developed in the past couple of years in Miami. Hmm. Even with Tua back outside of the first game, uh, I think Tyreek caught one big ball, but Tua and Waddle, I'm sorry, Tyreek and Waddle have been relatively ineffective in like, yeah, they're getting the run game going with a chain, but there's no reason we can't find ways to get both of those guys more involved in the offense. I know it was only Tua's first week back, but still, I feel like I'm seeing the same exact things. If it's not a quick screen, they're trying to do a slant or something across the middle. Teams are simply taking away the middle of the field, and Mike McDaniels doesn't seem to have a an answer for it, right? Like That's where Tua wants to throw the football. He's not a sideline thrower. He's not a field out thrower. He wants to deliver the ball on time in the middle of the field, and they need to find a way to scheme some guys open. Otherwise, you're going to see results like we've had in the past. It's going to be a missed or inaccurate deep shot to Tua. Or I'm sorry, to Tyreek, you know, trying to force that connection. Um, or you're going to see these quick screens over and over again that go for three yards. And then you run it two times. And now all of a sudden you're still in third and long. Like I just I'm having such an issue with the development of this Dolphins offense. And I really need to see against this Bills defense something different. The Broncos play at Baltimore. I think it's really interesting. Two five and three teams, different five and three, but really a good opportunity to see what Denver's actually got. How good are they? They're not supposed to win this football game. If they have a strong performance against Baltimore, it would be a huge statement for the Denver Broncos. If this game stays within one possession either way, I'll feel very, very good about the Broncos. Uh, However, if we're looking at it from an emotional or psychological standpoint, the Ravens kind of just got embarrassed. They are not happy. Hmm. They are looking at Denver licking their chops like we are going to come out and obliterate you. We are not having this happen, you know, so we'll we'll see how it shakes out. But I have pretty good confidence that that that, that wow, that the Ravens are going to come out here and, and, and flex a muscle a little bit, but also don't put it off on the Broncos to kind of hang around for a little bit. Well, I think that the Broncos offense is conducive to finding throws underneath and hanging around a game like this. I, I look the, the Ravens offense is built to hit you in the mouth and run the football heavily, but that doesn't mean Denver can't have long possessions and a bunch of third down conversions and five yards here, four yards there. I just hang around this game for way longer than it feels like they should just by the nature of their offense. So yeah, um, I, I don't count Denver out of this game. Honestly, I, I certainly don't either. The Eagles host the Jaguars. They're five and two. It's a great opportunity for Philly to really make another statement for the second week in a row and just come down hard and, and, and dominate a team like the Jaguars. I'm, I hope kind of for the sake of finding a challenger to Detroit, I'd like to see Philly dominate a game like this and make another statement for the second week in a row. Yeah, that'd be great to see. Jaguars are not going to be an easy out, though. I know that their record on paper is not great, but they've been challenging teams the past couple of weeks. They're just... Uh, Like we've talked about, something's just not right in Jacksonville. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr., he's now got some banged up ribs. We'll see how the offense kind of adjusts now that him and Christian Kirk are going to be out, you know, kind of indefinitely here. Um, But yeah, certainly an opportunity for Philadelphia to continue to build on their on their success right now. The Bears play Arizona. It's I want to see a follow up game from Caleb Williams after losing the way they did going 10 for 24. I'd like to see him have a better game against Arizona this week in week nine. I'm curious to see how the Arizona defense shows up. They kind of stifled, if you will, the the Miami offensive Miami offensive attack last week. Can mm. they follow it up against another high powered in terms of weapon uh, offense here this week? The three and four Rams play the four and four Seattle Seahawks. Sean McVay against Mike McDonald. It's a chance for the Rams to get back to 500, and um, you know as they battle in that division. I think the Rams are not dead. But they got to keep winning to stay alive. Yeah. Um, it's a huge game for both teams, in my opinion. I like the Rams in a close one here. I do too. Uh, neither primetime game is that great, in my opinion. The Colts play at Minnesota on Sunday night football. Yeesh. 
eh, I don't care. Tampa, who's banged up, plays Kansas City in Kansas City on Monday Night Football. Of course, the Chiefs have a, a primetime game at home. Seems like they get really favorable matchups. I'm not going to lie about Kansas City. I guarantee the talk of the town is going to be, remember the game Baker Mayfield played against Patrick Mahomes in college when Oklahoma had like, oh, they beat, yeah. like the game where they had like 800 yards combined or whatever the hell, Texas Tech and Oklahoma. I, the game's going to get brought up, up way more than it deserves. Yeah. And, and maybe the game is close just as that's what happens. Kansas City finds a way to grind out close games, but I can't imagine Kansas City losing to a banged up Tampa Bay Buccaneers team in Kansas City on Monday Night Football. When Godwin and Mike Evans were healthy, this was going to be a great matchup. Yeah. Um, man, it, it's it's going to be tough, uh, I think, for Tampa Bay. But uh, like we saw this week, you can't count them out because they'll be able to score some points. Chiefs defense, obviously excellent. And you're playing against the best quarterback of all time, Patrick Mahomes. Um, but yeah, like you said, Chiefs don't really blow teams out right now. Uh, so there will likely be an opportunity for Tampa Bay to win this game. There are three games I am really, really excited for this next weekend. Number one is this. The Lions at the Packers at Lambeau Field in Wisconsin. Six and one Lions against the six and two Green that Bay Packers. That game huge. Flex that game. I know. It's it's not a primetime game. It's the one o'clock start. Uh, we both got Game Pass, so we'll be watching it. Um, I, I'm just really... That's, that's the game in the NFL that I'm really, really stoked for. It's game of the weekend, in my opinion. I might turn all the other games off and just watch that one. I think me too. I, I like multi-view, but not when when there's a great game like that, it deserves to be treated like a primetime game that you just give all your focus to, in my opinion. Totally. totally. In college, number four, Ohio State plays at number three, Penn State. Ohio State 6-1, and one, Penn State 7-0. and oh. This is a massive game, man. Uh, it's a probably like after the, to me, I, I care more about Lions Packers, but this is the game of the weekend for a lot of people. And I don't blame them at all. Um, the question is, can Penn state beat Ohio state? Can Penn state win a big game when it matters? Their quarterback walked off the field injured this past weekend. My money's on Ohio state. If I was a betting man, I have a hard time believing in Penn state, even with a healthy drew Aller. What do you make of this game? Yeah, I just have a hard time betting on Penn state. Uh, just based off of history, right? <clears throat> kind of like we were talking about, you know, the Ravens versus the, um, uh, oh my goodness. Who are we just talking about in the NFL? Denver. Uh, no, uh, the Bills, right? Oh, yeah. Two very, very good teams year in and year out. <laughs> One team that gets a little bit closer than the other, but doesn't ultimately reach that pinnacle. It's like that Ryan Day, Ohio State team feels a lot like the Ravens. They're really, really good every year and they get close, but don't quite cross that threshold. And then the Bills have been really, really good for a number of years, but then getting these bigger matchups and they can't quite get over that hump. So that's kind of kind of how I see it. Like you said, betting man, you, you'd put your money on Ohio State. Um, offensively, I think is a it's going to be a tough matchup against Penn State. But yeah, we'll see. Penn State's got a good defense. My my weekend is going to go. So I, I thought about watching this game. My old high school football coach is retiring. So Friday night, uh, I'm going to go to his final ever high school football game. I guess I think they have played in the playoffs, but I'm, I'm going to watch his final home game. So I'm going to miss out on San Diego State at number 15, Boise State. If you're free Friday night, watch Ashton Genty. I just, they're just fun to watch. That's not actually a, a game I'm going to watch, but it, I wanted to mention it. But the other game on my radar this weekend, you know, I'm at 9 a.m. on Saturday for me, 9 a.m. West Coast time, Ohio State plays at Penn State. Then after that at 12.30 West Coast time, number one Oregon plays at Michigan in the big house. Big um, house. Oregon should win, but it's... It's just, just it's a big atmosphere. It's Michigan. Uh, I'm going to watch these games back to back and just have a bunch of snacks and have a great time on Saturday leading into my my Lions Packers game. A lot of Midwest football this weekend. Football happening yep. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Michigan this weekend that I'm really excited for. But that's a double feature to me is getting to watch or watch uh, Ohio State at Penn State and then Oregon at Michigan back to back. Yeah. Uh, it's just incredible uh, for me to get I, I think to get to watch that and have a kind of a full spread on Saturday. What do you yeah. think of that game? You're a big Duck fan. Yes. I think they walk in and smack or it was smack Michigan, but is that what you expect too? I don't think they smack them. Um, I think Why? two things. Michigan's got a very, very strong defensive front, mm. um, and I think that may cause problems for the University of Oregon run game. Uh, if the run game's not working, it's going to put a lot of pressure on Dylan Gabriel, and sometimes I feel like he can force the football and maybe give them a few turnovers. Um 
man, I'm trying to speak polite about this, but I kind of feel like we're going to go in and trounce them. But again, like this is a big environment. It's literally the big house. It's against Michigan. Yeah. Um, so you just, you don't know how they're going to respond in that moment. Um, their biggest games this year being Ohio State and Illinois have been at home this year. The yeah. games where they've been tested, uh, you know, Idaho and Boise State, those have been at home this year. If they get tested and they're on the road, how does that translate and how do they respond? I, I'm not going to lie to you. As far as Oregon staying undefeated, I think at Wisconsin's actually a tougher game than at Michigan. I know the atmosphere at Michigan. Both games a big are deal, scary. But Both games are scary. Wisconsin's a better team and like has a more th- bigger threat at quarterback and a better coach. And Michigan, the quarterback makes it hard for me to to really be concerned about them. If you want to see Oregon win, yeah. Just the thing about them is their front seven and the environment. And is is I think it's actually for for Oregon's sake, this is a great moment because you're playing a really tough road game against a team that's kind of gimped at the quarterback position. So if you got nerves early on, it's it's survivable. And then yeah. it, it's you have a game under your belt as a team playing on the road in a tough environment leading into the rest of the year where you got to play more games than this in tough environments on the road. So it's kind of a perfect baby's first tough road game, if you want to say with dealing Gabriel and the Oregon Ducks in a weird way. It's a weird way to put it. but um, Weird way to put it, but I, I understand the sentiment. Yeah, if you're going to have a tough road game, this is the one to have, I think, to start your your – to test your team this way. Yeah. It's not like walking into Georgia or something. Um, or Georgia, so, yeah. Oh my gosh, when yeah. the Ducks went to <laughs> played them in Mercedes Benz. Oh, was that two years ago now? Wow. Yeah. So I, I just, uh, yeah, it's a good weekend of football. I think the NFL's a little bit weak. I'm not gonna like the the primetime games kind of suck. Colts Vikings, like it'll be fun. I'm sure watching Sam Darnold will be cool. I'll enjoy that. I'm I'm gonna enjoy anything I watch in the football world. But Colts Vikings could be better. I, I wish there was a way to make Lions Packers the Sunday night football game, but. I think that's set in stone already, um, but I, I certainly think that's a better matchup in the NFL this weekend. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. All right, man, that's all I got. Um, I want to give you a, a compliment. I know today was, I'm not going to say what went on in your life, but I know today was a very stressful day. A lot of stuff happened. Uh, I don't know if we've talked about what's going on in, in my family. I'm also having a lot of weird stuff go down. Um, I, I saw a, a meme today on the days you give 40 and you've only got 40%. And, and then you gave a hundred, right? We gave all we had given a lot of, I think weirdness going on in our personal lives this weekend. Um, and tip of the cap, dude, great job. I think we, we made a good show despite a lot of nonsense that is not really our faults. Um, yeah. and, uh, good job, man. Hey, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and likewise to you, sometimes you're, like you said, you're not going to have a hundred percent, but if you can give what you do have and, uh, and again, like we love doing this, we love putting these shows together. And I think, uh, and hopefully that effort comes through and the, the objective is to put something out there that you guys can sit down and listen to and enjoy. I love seeing you guys talk about, you know, I'm going to load up the podcast. I got it like a two hour car ride and, and whatnot like that. That gets me really excited. Um, so yeah, keep, keep spreading love. You never know what somebody's going through. Um, and always, uh, yeah, always just appreciate the moment that you're in. Yeah. Guys, I love you. I appreciate you. Have a great day and a bum bum. Bam, we are done.